Hello and welcome to One Week, One Year, a podcast where we watch and discuss a year of film history every week, starting from 1895, the dawn of cinema, and this week is 1915. I'm one of your hosts, Chris Ellie. I'm a film projectionist, and joining me as always is... I'm Glenn Covell. I'm a filmmaker. And uh, joining us for the first time is my friend, Marcus. What's up, Marcus? <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> No, what? quiet the applause. <laughs> Wait, what What are you? What? How do you describe yourself in a sort of brief way? Well, I always hate to describe myself, you know, but huh? I <laughs> am a writer and an artist um, and I guess a bookseller um, yes. from Kansas City, Missouri, but living in New York. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so... Uh, for anyone listening, uh, we are talking about a lot of public domain film, so a lot of it is available for free online. Uh, we'll have links to all of the movies in the description, uh, but then if you're watching the YouTube version, we'll be playing the movies as we talk about them, so you can see what we're talking about, uh, just so you're aware of all that stuff. Um, but anyway, how's how's everybody doing? What's What's going on? Not Not much, as usual. I feel like I never have good answers for the for the banter segment you gotta do more things um it's true <laughs> that would help um i don't know i watched the oscars last night they were weird um were they always. zoom was it like a zoom type situation uh i think only people who were in other countries were were doing that but like i don't know it was in union station which was weird and mm -hmm. it was in 24 frames which was weird yeah Hmm. Like I'm like the one person who noticed like oh the frame rate's different. <laughs> did did you notice like you could tell on on the television? Yeah, well the, the first thing I noticed is like they didn't shoot it with uh with, like the typical kind of like broadcast cameras that live events are usually filmed on. Um like it was filmed with like nicer cameras and I was like, "Hey, this looks nice. That's new." <laughs> um Yeah, I don't know. They were the Oscars. I have never been less plugged into the Oscars than I was this year. I think I watched one of the movies, uh, Mank, and then Same. Uh, I, I yeah. didn't even I didn't even really <laughs> intend on watching it. <laughs> I watched a couple more than that, but um, yeah, m most of like the big, the big winners I I did not see. I couldn't even tell you ten movies that came out in the last year. <laughs> Yeah, ever since ever since I stopped, it's, I mean, ever since I stopped working for a movie theater, like I've stopped going to the movies because they're so fucking expensive. But mm, also, yep. I just feel like shit. I don't. I don't know. I don't know if anything is as not not that movies are you know films right now are horrible. I just don't know if that, if I want to if it's worth spending that kind of bread for a mediocre exp you know experience you know. That's that's why we're kind of looking toward the past a bit for, uh, uh, I don't know if you would call this mediocre or what. But <laughs> yeah. Um, have you been up to anything anything interesting, Marcus? You said you were working a bit, but yeah, I'm just working really. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, got I've got shit going on. You know, I was saying that I have a solo show later on this year in New York. And so I'm just kind of like planning for that shit. By it's planning, exciting. I mean, I mean, yeah. I'm thinking about it, you know. I have done no planning this whole this whole day. I was like, I should buy like a hard drive, maybe, and you know, organize or like, what am I gonna put in the space? I'll figure it out. Do but, you know like what yeah. kind of media you're gonna be working in? It's gonna be all media. It's gonna be a lot of. I don't really have any solid plan, but it's going to be some videos that I created, but also there'll be elements of like a reading room. And so it'll have like some books and also like a bunch of my notebooks. And um, I don't know, maybe some of the, the sculptures just to get them out of my house. I haven't like made like a sculpture in a minute. Oh, I forgot about those. Yeah. Those are so cool. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't made, you know, any of that shit in a minute. And so I'm like, maybe I should just like just to get it the fuck out of my house. Right. For a little bit, <laughs> you know, put it in there, but we'll we'll see. <laughs> the theme is things that I need to get out of my house. <laughs> <laughs> Low key. <laughs> um, what have I been doing? I uh, 
I went to visit my partner's parents in the city, and I have been just been playing with my new cat lately. So that's been nice. Nothing else really. I got a new yeah. cat. <laughs> new cat is huge. Yes. Yeah. What's I said name? I said it like two weeks ago, but oh my god, she's so cute. Her name is Marceline. Uh, Great and name. She's she's a tiny black cat. Yeah, it wasn't. So uh, my partner's cat, uh, who she got before we got together, uh, yeah. is Finn. Um, <laughs> and, and she was she was like she was like uh, I, you know my second cat. I think it would be funny to name it Marceline, and I want it to be like a black cat, like a female black cat. And I was thinking, mm-hmm. like, I don't want to, I don't want to be so restrictive. I want, like, yeah. I want like <laughs> the the cat that strikes me to be the right cat, right, you know. Course. But then, like, there was a tiny, like, four and a half month black cat, like, girl, and uh, and then yeah, Marceline the Vampire Queen, you know. <laughs> yeah, it all worked out. Cute. Yeah. Um. Well. Uh, before we get started, we always like to give ourselves a little bit of context for what's happening in the year uh, that we're talking about. Uh, so we gather together a few of the notable news items. Uh, so Glenn, would you read us the news from 1915? The news of the year, 1915. Harry Houdini performs his first suspended straitjacket escape. Suffrage set back in the U.S. as the House of Representatives rejects a proposal to give women the right to vote. Alexander Graham Bell and his assistant, Watson, speak from across the nation. The first coast-to-coast telephone call is made. Germany's use of chemical weapons begins in the war. 18,000 tear gas artillery shells are launched on the Imperial Russian Army. The first photographs of Pluto are taken. Boxer Jack Johnson is finally defeated after seven years of holding the title of heavyweight champion. Hated by racists as a black man, he defeated countless white contenders until his defeat by what they dubbed Great White Hope, Jess Willard. In a quest to conquer neighboring land, Italy leaves the Triple Alliance with Germany and Austria-Hungary to join the Allied Entente powers. The civilian vessel RMS Lusitania is sunk by German U-boats, killing nearly 1,200 only three years after the Titanic disaster. The Armenian Genocide begins. One million ethnic Armenians slaughtered by the Ottoman Empire in the chaos of the Great War. The inception of aerial combat, the first air-to-air gunning down of another plane by the Germans. Kafka's The Metamorphosis is published. Albert Einstein presents his theory of general relativity. The United Daughters of the Confederacy holds its first annual meeting. Their sinister mission to rewrite Civil War history in favor of the South begins. Partially inspired by the birth of a nation... The second Ku Klux Klan is founded. William Fox founds the Fox Film Corporation in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Metro Pictures, one of the predecessors to Metro Goldwyn Mayer, opens shop. A hearing before the Supreme Court, Mutual Film Corp versus Industrial Commission of Ohio. In a unanimous verdict in favor of the censorship board, the court decides that film is not protected free speech. <laughs> oh, what a what a year that was. Yeah, right. A lot of, a lot of grim stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that one, that uh, uh, that mutual film corp versus Ohio was like a kind of wild thing. Uh, I guess it got overwritten or overruled like a dozen or so years later, but it basically said that you like films could not be free speech because uh, there are all these like local censorship boards mm. um, Interesting. doing their own thing. Uh, Well, uh, so Marcus is here to talk about uh, Birth of a Nation and Hypocrites, uh, and he'll be back at the end of the feature presentation segment. So, uh, Marcus, see you then. Well, now that we are not starting with uh, Fantumas, we can start uh, in in length, I don't know, what what do you call it, length order? I yeah. guess shortest to longest. So let's uh, let's start with one week, one reel, <laughs> and our jingle that does not exist. Uh, man, I can like track down. I mean, I have a lot of just recordings that I've made myself of film projectors revving up. Uh, we're getting we're getting so jingle. I like the jingle aspect. Not yeah, to it's great. Distract from all this and make this long episode even longer, but no, or I'll <laughs> cut this out. But like, uh, I think the I think the jingles are fun. <laughs> no, I I love it. It 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 uh it jazzes me up every time. 
Um, I guess we might as well start with uh, Charlie Chaplin. Right? Yeah, I mean, he is uh, probably the most prominent guy in, in short films at this point. Yeah. Um, and he made a, a pretty significant one this year. The Tramp. The Tramp. The, yeah. the titular Tramp. Not the first movie where he played the Tramp, but the first one where it is like him as a character. It is kind of, I do think it is sort of, um, in the movies where I've seen him play the Tramp before this, it wasn't really the character that we're used to seeing. It was a much yeah. harsher, kind of more drunker, anti- <laughs> drunker more antagonistic <laughs> version of that uh, persona. Yeah. And this movie actually kind of distills that down into the sort of sweeter, more heartfelt uh, character that we're used to seeing in, in his later movies. I think this movie is delightful. Me too. Um, uh, I, I feel like it's a good palate cleanser from Birth of a Nation, which we'll be getting to. Yeah. Uh, but you don't get that palate cleanser, listener, because we're doing no. the shorts first. <laughs> <laughs> um. I mean, I watched it before, which maybe was a bad idea, but... Um, mm-hmm. It got me excited to watch the rest of the movies for this week. Uh, before we get to the plot, um, yeah. I'm going to give a little, I guess, backstory to how this movie was made. Mm. Because uh, in 1915, Charlie Chaplin left Keystone Studios, where he'd been working for the for the last year. That's right. Um, to make movies at uh, SNA Studios. Um, because they paid him more money and gave him more control. Um, there, I think I kind of got the impression there was almost like a bidding war going on for Charlie Chaplin. Like everyone wanted him to be making movies at their studio, and yeah, he was just like insanely popular in within the, his yeah. first year of working. Um, and uh, SNA won out. Um, and so this was not the first movie he made at that studio. I think it was like the fourth or fifth. Um, but uh, yeah, it's uh, I don't know, Chris. Well, how would you describe this movie? uh yeah i mean it's um so it's really solidifying his tramp character and all of his kind of um quirks and characterizations and whatnot um he's kind of a wandering hobo type a tramp and he happens upon this girl who is being mugged by some more some less photogenic tramps (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, and therefore evil. Um, and he kind of like bumblingly saves her from them. Uh, uh, he, uh, he does everything bumblingly in this movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and she kind of, to thank him, like, you know, offers him dinner at her house and he ends up sort of working on her farm. Uh, and a lot of hijinks happen. Yeah. Eventually the other, tramps come back to the farm and they say hey you you're one of us tra- a tramp uh so uh why don't you work with us to steal from them and 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 whatever and he does not uh, you know he's kind of caught feelings for this lady and he's th- appreciative for for the, her family helping him out and so he sort of agrees but then schemes to 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 get rid of them uh clandestinely uh and uh more hijinks ensue <laughs> more hijinks ensue uh at the end he gets them but then her her bow shows up and he's like wait a second <laughs> i thought i was the guy you know he so he writes a kind of like a, a a sad letter saying uh i thought i was your guy uh i was i was <laughs> and uh i'm sad now so i'm going to take my leave and then you know the the movie kind of closes on this melancholic note of of the tra- the the love the lovesick tramp walking away and then the camera the uh, i don't know the iris I- iris is closes in, yeah. on him yeah which we've done, there's been a lot of iris stuff um up to now but this is like just the classic silent film ending of like the iris iris on the someone walking away it's like ah yeah. it's iconic <laughs> yeah um I and mean, it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of bittersweet at the end. Like he he is walking away sadly, but then kind of right as the iris is closing in, he he kind of picks himself back up and and is like, all right, back back on the road. 
He's a jaunty fellow. He is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well said. And I mean, speak, speaking of his, the way that he moves, uh, which is just everything about Charlie Chaplin, it's it's so solidified here. And I feel like the Tramp character is just built out of all of these strange ticks uh, that he's decided to put in in this person's motion. But they the ticks illustrate who he is. Like he um like whenever he, he he's always tipping his hat to people, you know, or like picking his hat up, mm-hmm. I guess, as a as a sort of greeting but um you know he does it to i think he does it to the cow uh you know (laughs) like does it everybody um that the silent movie style of acting uh is i think i think in a lot of people's minds is this performance you know yeah Mm -hmm. like specifically this performance yeah Yeah. (laughs) um yeah i think that is is very astute I mean, it's like I had never seen this short, but it it is it feels almost like the quintessential Charlie Chaplin short film. Yeah. Um. And yeah, it's like you, you can definitely see he directed this this movie. Um, and you can definitely kind of see his his directing skills starting to grow compared to his uh like his early Keystone movies. Um, the comedy in this is a lot less madcap. Um. And there's a lot more kind of heart in this than the than the Keystone movies for sure. It's 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 still slapsticky, but yeah. I think it's you, the madcap nature. I think is a good word to use because Tilly's punctured romance was just throwing everything yeah. at you all the time, um, and this this one has a lot of slapstick gags in it. But I feel like they're a little more well well structured mm-hmm. and well considered about where they're put. Yeah. Um, I feel like there's a little bit more, um, a little more comedy just coming out of like, uh, the, the tramp like personality. Um, Mm -hmm. it's less him. He falls over a lot in this movie. Um, but it's, it's, it's like, there is a lot of him just sort of like misunderstanding things or like trying to do something in a funny way and it doesn't work out. Um, it's a, know, it, it's less reliant on just like smash and grab comedy, I guess, is how I would think of like a Keystone movie. Um, one thing he's really, really good at in this movie, and I mean all of his movies really, but this one it stuck out of uh, like kind of playing to camera in a way that lets the audience in on the joke a bit. Hmm. Like not quite fully breaking the fourth wall, but like kind of peeking over the fourth wall almost <laughs> um like like little little winks to camera that really kind of make make the audience feel like they're kind of being brought into the 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 comedy as opposed to it just sort of happening in front of them hmm that's interesting yeah it, you mean just sort of in the way that he carries himself like it almost acknowledges that there's another person in the room that is the camera yeah like i don't i don't know if he ever like directly like looks into the lens of the camera i don't think so but it's like he gets as close as he possibly can without doing that you know i you were talking about the 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 gags too this um there's some like good some some really good gags in this but like this movie is obsessed with butt jokes you know or and more or maybe it's just charlie chaplin in in general i think it's more that because <laughs> i mean it's like it's slapstick right but like i like we saw this in his movies from last year where he was like kicking people in the butt a bunch yeah but let me let me tell you all the things that happened to butts in this movie <laughs> you made a list they get kicked they get kicked by self they get poked with pitchfork fallen upon Caught on fire, singed with a candle, doused in water, scratched, hit with a plank, grabbed, and then stuck out toward the camera. Mm-hmm. All within this 25-minute movie. Like, like everything, you know, and every one of those is a different joke, yeah. basically. I mean, you know, butts are funny. It's, yes. it's just a fact. Yeah. yeah. Um. Um, <laughs> and so he, fall, he falls really good, too. Yeah. Which um, is also, I mean, that is butt-related. Yes. Because he, he usually falls on his butt. 
and I, I want to I wanna also point out my favorite gag in the movie, like this killed me, was uh, he was trying to, you know, he's helping out on the farm and he was trying to milk a cow <laughs> and he puts the bucket under the the cow's udders. I guess he doesn't know how to do it. So he like takes the cow's tail and pumps it up and down as if he's like doing like a well pump <laughs> and like tries to get the milk out that way. <laughs> and I was, I was very shocked by that. I thought but it was very it's funny. like, yeah, he doesn't look at the camera during that, but he like turns to the camera to make an expression. To, be, to have a, like, hmm, this isn't working face. And then he goes back to it. You know, it's like he's always sort of playing to camera in that in that way. Yeah. Um, one cool thing about this that I noticed while watching it is one of the uh, one of the bad tramps um, is played by an actor named Bud Jameson, who I actually didn't know the name of before this, but I, I recognized him in this from his many appearances in Three Stooges shorts from the oh. 30s and 40s he's in so many of those as like the straight man as the guy reacting to like hijinks happening um and i was like is that the same guy and it it was uh i think he was only like 21 when he made when this movie came out hmm. so he had a a several decade career as like part part of these uh like early hollywood uh slapstick comedies which i, I don't know i just thought that was kind of cool I, speaking of Three Stooges, I felt like uh, Pool Sharks by uh, W.C. Fields or starring W.C. Fields had a lot of Three Stooges vibes in it. Yeah, I wrote that down. I was like, strong <laughs> Three Stooges energy in this one. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, this is this is his debut, right? W.C. Fields? Yes. I think he was pretty big on the vaudeville stages mm-hmm. uh, uh, before this. But but yeah, he this was... This was his film debut. I mean, there's there is a lot of this takes place in primarily around a, a comedic game of pool, as the, the title would suggest. And yeah, there's there's something about like juggling and like trying to there. There's a bit where he's like trying to replace uh, the 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 pool balls on like a rack and they keep falling off and he keeps grabbing them, putting them back on, grabbing them, uh-huh. putting them back on. And I'm like, this feels like a Three Stooges gag. There is definitely, I think, a a style of comedy that this is playing in that definitely, yeah, reminded me of of Three Stooges stuff. And and I mean, there's also like a lot of f- comedic fighting in this movie. Yeah, uh, including eye, like eye pokes. Eye, eye pokes. That was the yeah. thing that really that really sold me on that idea. <laughs> yeah, very different kinds of eye pokes. Mm-hmm. You know, not the classic two pronged. Uh, you know, Three Stooges style eye poke. Um, and but yeah, like a lot of slappy, bitey, like <laughs> comedy <laughs> fights. Um, I mean, yeah, a guy guy falls uh head first into a, a barrel of water with the legs sticking out. Um, you know, just just classic gags. <laughs> it's it is really hard to describe a lot of these. Uh, slapstick movies because it's they're, all in the watching. Yeah, you know. they're pretty narratively thin. This is like two two guys are fighting over a woman that they meet at a picnic, and so they def- decide or like to break up their fight. Some of the other people at the picnic are like, "I know how we'll settle this: a game of pool." And so they go to the pool hall, and uh, you know, hijinks ensues. Yeah, including uh, some stop motion. Uh, pool balls yeah uh, the way that they, they they're doing all these trick shots and they they have very zany trick shots that aren't possible in real life and those are done through stop motion animation yeah um this would have been a good segue but i want to say one more thing about this movie <laughs> and that uh did you notice that the intertitles looked stylistically way different than than something from 1915 yeah i don't think they were original so I was, I, I, you know, I was initially under the impression like, oh, these are original, they're black and white, everything like that. Um, and these intertitles have a very distinctive, like 1950s, 1960s look to them, mm-hmm. uh, just yeah. graphic design wise, which I was kind of proud of myself for p- picking out because <laughs> uh, I went back to the beginning and I saw a copyright from 1967 on it. Mm. So... These were intertitles that were added later, and and it, 
it's hard to describe. It's kind of this, like, on the intertitles, it's this woven kind of cloth looking background yeah, with a got, very like, particular textured. font. Yeah, yeah. Textured background with like a very particular 50s, 60s feeling font on it. Uh, and I was like, yes, nailed it. Not original intertitles. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, yeah, the, the intertitles, I'm like, this feels like 60s TV. Way too much for it to be original. Um, we've it it yeah i mean we've seen people do some interesting stuff with stylistic intertitles um yeah but, yeah uh not to that degree i don't think mm-hmm. but speaking of stop motion yes we were just speaking of stop motion <laughs> <laughs> um this year 1915 marks the first or the at least the earliest surviving film of willis o'brien who was a, a pioneer of stop motion Mm-hmm. And like using stop motion for like characters, um, a lot of the stop motion that we've seen thus far, some of it has been like characters moving around, but a lot of it has been like human characters at least, because we had the the lot of slaw uh, um, right. bug movies. Yeah. Um, but uh, Willis O'Brien is probably most famous for doing the the animation in King Kong, um, as well as uh, uh, a bunch of other movies from the 20s and 30s but uh this is his first like uh you know prehistoric stop motion movie um and so it 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 you know it feels a somewhat a piece with with his later more famous work it's much more uh much less refined um mm-hmm. you know makes sense uh although it's interesting that this this short film, The Dinosaur and the Missing Link, it's called, focuses much more on human characters than I think I expected. I expected something a bit more creature based. Hmm. Um, but yeah, it's a bunch of, uh, you know, sort of cartoon cavemen um, getting up, getting into <laughs> into trouble. <laughs> um, there is there is there's one. Uh, joke that I really did appreciate or I really laughed at that's just intertitle dialogue um, when uh, one of the one of the cave people walks out and says I'd offer you tea but unfortunately tea hasn't been invented yet <laughs> <laughs> classic uh, prehistory joke I feel like we should do more of that kind of stuff in the news segment <laughs> <laughs> um, after uh watching Gertie the dinosaur last year and this this year i'm not expecting a dinosaur film every year which is maybe unrealistic but and you will be disappointed if there's not yeah um the one, yeah. one week one dinosaur <laughs> <laughs> um there is also like some i guess somewhat intentional humor of like all the cavemen speak in i guess sort of contemporary for the time english so they say things like a mere trifle <laughs> and it's like oh that's not what caveman sounded like i wonder yeah that's interesting <laughs> i wonder if that's like meant to be a joke or they just had not invented caveman speak yet no they didn't know that cave Neander- neanderthals only said things like one two three in high-pitched voices is that a reference to something <laughs> it is we can cut that out <laughs> have you have you seen that there's like a bbc documentary about neanderthals uh, and there's this poor guy that is forced to like demonstrate how their like bodies and vocal cords affected their speech. Um, and it, oh <laughs> yes, like, oh so they had a very they had a very large chest, so they were very loud. <laughs> and then Two, three, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they were very nasal. <laughs> and it just each it gets funnier and funnier each time he says a thing because he he gets higher pitched and louder and more nasal. It's incredible. It's um it's. A as close as I can get to what I what I wished was real with that mummy recreation voice. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> the, the mummy <laughs> going ah, <laughs> <laughs> which is much funnier than ah. Although yeah. ah, it's still pretty funny for a big build up of like <laughs> we're gonna show you what mummies really sounded like. <laughs> ah. That's a good In ancient Egypt. This is what people's voices were. Ah. <laughs> Well, uh, I guess we could talk about our final short, uh, mm-hmm. which is Two Nights of Vaudeville. 
Directed um, by... We don't know. Unknown. Some unknown yeah. director for Ebony Films, which was one of the Jacksonville, Florida film studios. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a white-owned film studio that is making films with black actors for black audiences in segregated Nickelodeons. Um, but uh, I thought it was interesting in this movie trying to parse out how much of this is kind of talking or is making fun of black people uh, versus trying to engage with them as an audience in a, in a uh, good faith way, I guess. Right. Um, I mean, it apparently did get some flack at the time for how it's, it's, it's very broad and it, it definitely perpetuates a lot of negative stereotypes. And that was, apparent enough at the time that it, it you know it got some pushback um so it is the sort of thing where watching it now it definitely feels very you know over exaggerated stereotypes and it's like oof this is a little it, it gets a little uh uncomfortable um yeah. at points um though not nearly as bad as the movie that we're going to talk about later in the show um what's that <laughs> <laughs> Um, but it is interesting to see like what was, what I guess what was being marketed towards a black audience at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which we haven't seen much of. Yeah. I assume that Elise Guy's movie, oh my God, what was it called? A Fool and His Money, um, mm-hmm. uh, might've been marketed toward black audiences. Um, mm-hmm. uh, similar to that movie, this one has an all black cast. And now that I think about it, has any movie had like a black character who doesn't speak in a stereotyped garbage for uh, that we've seen so far? Like, I mean, like people in blackface in the Italian movies, maybe. <laughs> oh yeah, like, they don't know what they're Italian. They don't. They that's don't like, even know what black people are. <laughs> that's like the closest thing I think we've gotten to like non exaggerated, uh, like caricaturized uh language right um uh yeah it's you know this one's got a intertital it's like to give you an idea of what it sounds like it's like yes uh yes uh am lieben here right now Oof. as as he's getting kicked out of a theater um gross uh yeah i mean the um the basic setup of this i think it's kind of interesting like it's it's trying to in, in one way, it's trying to, like, dignify the idea of a black space, but mm-hmm. in another way is maybe contributing to an idea of segregation, which is something that was being yeah. considered at this time. Uh, it's two, two black guys who find some, uh, some kind of hot, uh, vaudeville theater tickets on the ground, and they go into the vaudeville show... And they start acting really ra- rowdy inside of the show. Uh, part of it is just showing the vaudeville acts to waste time, I guess. <laughs> um, and uh, they end up getting kicked out uh, after they go on stage. And they decide to start their own vaudeville show uh, uh, for black people. And uh, and then they do that. And And so a lot of it is like... A lot of the movie is featuring the different vaudeville acts that they are watching at the various stages, but that's mm-hmm. sort of the framing device. I mean, I I do like the premise of it, other than the sort of like slight implication that black people shouldn't be in like invited into white vaudeville theaters. Yeah. Um. It's like. Um. But I I like, in general, I like movies about people who are refused something and then decide to like do their own version of it kind of they say um, i'm gonna make my own <laughs> i'm gonna make my own vaudeville theater with blackjack and hookers in <laughs> fact forget the vaudeville theater <laughs> i i had that joke in the back of my head but i i wasn't gonna just blatantly I, steal from bender from futurama <laughs> it's called um, a reference it's called a reference all right. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i mean like that I don't know. I, I, I find that concept. There, there are a lot of movies made about that kind of thing. And I, I always find it compelling and kind of inspiring. Um, yeah. I think if you take the politics out of it, it's a pretty 
you know, inspiring movie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's it's hard to view it that way in in any sort of contemporary context, but I think I think that was probably its intent was sort of like, um, at least I hope I hope that was its intent was sort of a story of of people who were kicked out of a sort of an established uh, theater and then their their love of it do their own thing although it is also the movie ends with the the audience that they invite to their show hating their show and throwing stuff at them and then being like well like i said didn't work (laughs) that's true i forgot about that yeah (laughs) um well that wraps it up for one week one reel uh watched a couple a handful of shorts this week but um before we do that that horrible film (laughs) <laughs> Let's talk about in case in case you wondered what our reaction to it would be. <laughs> Before we do that, why don't we all take a bite from the cereal bowl? Uh... This week for uh, the cereal bowl, we started watching uh, Louis Fouillard's follow up movie serial to Fantumas, mm-hmm. Le Vampires. Le Vampires. Oh, what is it? Would it would it be Le Vampires maybe? Le Vampires. Le, le Vampires. <laughs> um, or the Vampires, if you want to be boring about it. Um, which or, uh, or Les Vampires, if you want to think that it's a more interesting <laughs> thing than it, than it actually is. Um, yeah, it's uh, it feels very, it feels a lot like Fantomas. It's he's now it working does. with with yeah. a, an original IP, as it were. Um, but he, he's bringing over a lot of the, the Fantumas style and sort of narrative trappings. I like that, that he's finding this place in crime films. He seems very obsessed with them, which is yeah. fun, you know? I think yeah. he does them pretty well. Although I will say that on the whole, uh, of what I've seen of Le Vampire so far, I, I kind of dig the vibe of Fantumas a bit more. Mm-hmm. Um, Same. It's it's a little more spooky and threatening, and it like engaging your emotions a little bit. And I think the plotting is also a little cleaner. Yeah, I mean, I think because he was working off of, uh, you know, a set of novels with Fantomas, a lot of the kind of narrative heavy lifting had been done already. He was working off of a, you know a pretty refined story that existed already. Yeah. Whereas this, he's sort of like, what can I take all the stuff that I like? from doing Fantomas of like crime and gangs and disguises and escapes and like do my own version of that. And it, it feels a little bit uh, more narratively shaky, I guess it doesn't, the writing I don't think is as good in, in live empires. It's very, very predictable. Um, I think I was actually like kind of surprised by how surprised I was with Fantomas Phantom Oz um, got me. Like yeah. there were twists in that that I was like, "Oh my god!" What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This one, I feel like, I you know the whole the whole time I'm going, "Oh, this is gonna happen next," and then it did, and then this is gonna happen next, and it did. Uh, A little bit. I um, and I'm not usually one to like try and outguess movies, which I feel like is a bad way to watch movies. It is, yeah. Um, but it wasn't awful. It was it was fun, and I yeah. had it had a lot of really cool style in it for sure. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the, I guess general sort of like premise of, uh, the vampires is, uh, we follow an intrepid reporter, Philippe, uh, Gouronde. Nice. Um, it sounds like I pronounced it correctly, but I probably didn't. Um, sort of in, in the vein of, uh, of Fandor from Phantom Us. Um, and he is investigating, uh, uh, a crime ring, a gang called the vampires uh they aren't actually vampires i know you were disappointed by that (laughs) they are just criminals but they they have a lot of uh i guess sort of pageantry and theatricality um that uh vampires are sort of known for um and uh and so we we uh over the first we watched the first three parts the first three episodes yeah, the, the, the three that were released in 1915. Uh, the first two were released on November 13th, and the third one, oh my god, was released on December 4th of 1915. Mm. Um, so the first episode is is 
titled The Severed Head, which is already already or interested. La, la Tête Coupée. <laughs> um, and so uh, Philippe, our, our hero, finds out that a, a local police inspector has been found beheaded. Um, he also finds out that all of his notes on the, the vampire gang has been has been stolen and they they uh they find he finds out that uh this guy Mazamet uh who I guess works in the same building I think has stole stole the files for the vampires because they the the vampires are threatening his family um that's important because Mazamet is going to be a a recurring character in these yeah um he he almost calls the cops on on Mazamet, but then he shows him a picture of his family, and he's like, "Oh, please, they I have, got a family." They have my family. <laughs> Do they actually have his family? I thought they were just kind of vaguely threatening I, him. No, I, I don't think they have they have them like kidnapped somewhere. But I think it's sort of like, "Do what we say, or your family gets it." Yeah. Um, but so Phil- Philippe, who lives with his mother, um, and sometimes kind of feels like. He's played by an actor who's probably in his thirties. It kind of feels like Philippe is like a, a kid detective at times, even though he's <laughs> he's an adult man. There's a part in the third episode where he's like in his in his PJs um, for most of the episode, and it's like this would make more sense if he was like twelve. <laughs> um, but so he he, he goes he goes to visit an old family friend, Doctor Knox, who lives in a big spooky chateau. Um, while watching this, I was still expecting every character to be Phantomas in disguise, which yeah, right. <laughs> turns out to not entirely be a bad instinct to have mm-hmm. watching this. Yeah. Um, the vampires use the same costume as Phantomas while doing crimes, the sort of hooded black, uh, like circus outfit. I think it's a little tighter. It's a little more like a, like a little sneaky, uh, sneaky cat burglar. Uh, Maybe and it's yeah. like a little skin tight, you know. Um, but so, uh, uh, Philippe is framed for the theft of some jewels of a wealthy American woman who's also staying at the chateau. Uh, he finds a secret compartment behind a painting, uh, and inside the he goes to like get the 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 judge, and they go back, and inside the compartment is a box containing the the severed head of the inspector. <gasps> and then they find uh. The American woman, Margaret Simpson, has been murdered and Dr. Knox has vanished up the chimney. And they find a note that repeal, reveals that Dr. Knox was actually murdered and the guy that they were, had been talking to and thought the doctor was Dr. Knox was actually the grand vampire in disguise. <laughs> and it ends with him sort of escaping across the roof like a, like a spooky Spider-Man. Very cat-like. He's like, he's creeping and crawling and he's climbing on yeah. roofs. Cat, um, cat burglar on a hot tin roof and each the grand vampire appears in each episode but i think in at least two of the episodes he is played by a different actor Wait, which is really ex- i believe so um he always looks different and that is explained in the in the context of the story is oh he's in a different disguise yeah but apparently they had to keep recasting that role because people kept having to go off and fight in world war 1 which was, you know, happening in France. Uh, oh, as as this was being made. Oh my God, I didn't realize um, that. I didn't so they know kept, that they kept losing actors because they had to go, you know, fight the Germans. Jesus, <laughs> you gotta uh, wonder, is... like, what was what is happening? We've we've never been lived in a country where a war is happening in, you know. How much yeah. does life go on and you make movies and go to the movie theater when war is happening in your country? Like your country's trying to be invaded and stuff. Yeah. It's it is something that I I have thought a lot about of like as an American, that's something that I have certainly never experienced and I don't really know if anyone I'm like directly related to has ever experienced because it's like it's not a thing that really happens in the United States. Like there aren't like large scale land invasions. Or, or wars on U.S. soil, really. Like we're soft. There's the Civil War. It's like the big one. Yeah. Um. But other than that, it's mostly like wars being fought in other countries. Yeah. Um. And one thing that I find, I'm going off on a tangent here, but one thing I find really compelling about like World War II films from other countries is 
or war films in general from other countries is how different their perspective is um, and how it is much mm. more about like this is a thing happening to us here now where we live as opposed to like American World War One or World War Two films are like, oh, yeah, we're off, you know, to another country to fight yeah. to fight the war. We, and then we like, go where the war is. And then we return and it's like, oh, yeah, OK, cool. Um, That's true. Yeah, that's really and interesting. And so. I've been I've been watching a lot of World War II movies, particularly from from Europe or about Europe, um, and they they just they they hit so differently, and they they feel so much more personal. Hmm. Um, as far as I can tell, like the war, apart from the casting, doesn't really influence this film. Uh, yeah, you you'd never guess it. Uh, watching it, like. It doesn't really feel that different from Phantomas or or anything else we've watched. Yeah. In that sense, like it doesn't feel like there there's no references to a war happening or anything like that. Uh Yeah, so I mean this one it it so it's got the broad strokes of similarity to Phantomas of a lot of detective V goings on, a lot mm-hmm. of tricky thieves who leave business cards um, yeah <laughs> a lot uh, of notes and cards being left behind i mean it's the kind of gr- like a m- you know master thief wanting to leave a calling card situation except yeah. they kind of left like a short essay um <laughs> i uh uh i have to make the joke that the rich american is called maggie simpson um, uh <laughs> And I also have to make the joke, what's in the box? Because of course. They, of course. Because they found the head in the box. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I have a joke for episode two, the ring that kills, which already that sounds like a pun title because like physical ring or like crime ring. Oh. Um, episode two opens up with one of my favorite things about old timey things is... Uh, a guy going to the club to read the news, um, which is just, I love the concept of like, I got to go to like my fancy club so I can read the paper. Um, like sit in a nice chair. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it reminds me of like Sherlock Holmes stories. Um, <clears throat> but so there's, there's this count um, who's reading, reading in the paper about how uh, Philippe, the reporter, is like rumored to be the fiance of this famous dancer. And I was like, how famous is Philippe, the, 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 the kid reporter who's 35, um, that there are rumors <laughs> in the news about like who he's like engaged to. This um, kind of thing happened with Fandor too. And, esp- and also in this, where it's like, this person <laughs> is like, Oh, Fandor is on the case. Fandor lives here. Like, uh, 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 Philippe lives here and he is investigating yeah. the crime ring. There is no consequences to us making the, the reporter into such a character that we report yeah. on his personal life and tell you where he lives when he is doing in depth work on a crime ring. <laughs> but also, just like the only person I could think of that is like a famous reporter is like Ronan Farrow, maybe, as someone who is like. Like Ronan Farrow has like uh-huh. shown up on Colbert, you know, as a guest. It's like yeah. he's well known enough for like doing really in depth uh, reporting that it's like, oh, he's like a famous reporter. But also, he has yeah. like all these family connections that make him kind of well known. Also, um, yeah. that he also has done a lot of reporting on. But yeah, I, know, I was trying to think of like what is an equivalent of of a character like this, of someone who is like in the public eye just for like their their reporting. I mean, I think journalists used to be more known because there were like kind of more centralized journalism areas, right? Yeah. Like your your uh um what you call them? So your that's all the oh my god. That's the way the cookie crumbles. Well, no. <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm blanking on the name, but you know, all of these like these news anchors from the fifties and sixties who are like the news anchor, you know? Right. But at least, at least they're like visible. They're on television talking to you. This is just like a guy who is in the, I don't know. We're talking too much about this tiny thing. Um, (laughs) But I, I, that was just, I found that amusing. 
Um, and so the count goes to the goes to the ballet. He's seeing this this sort of bat vampire themed ballet that the um, uh, well, it's based on the vampires, isn't it? Isn't it supposed to be like a um, it's called a- the vampires. I don't know if it's actually based on the criminals. I feel like what's happening is that they are taking some creative liberties. I think this is Phantomas episode one again, where they're oh. doing they're doing a play of the crime gang that's in the news right now. Yeah, that does make sense. Um, because then uh, the count uh, gifts the um, Philippe's fiance. Uh, what was her name? Marfa. Marfa. Um, Terrible name. Yeah. He he gives her a, a a ring as a gift, which is poisoned. Um, and so she she wears this poison ring, and and after the performance, she dies. Um, or she dies on stage. Yeah. And uh, and she's in this like bat costume. And I thought, is this, is this the show that uh scared Bruce Wayne as a kid? Um, <laughs> I mean this this. She moves like Batman. She looks like Batman yeah. in this in this uh, stage uh, performance. Like she's got this the way that she moves with her cape. Uh, it it's almost hasn't. She is dressed as Batman. Basically. Yeah, <laughs> like her cape her cape moves uh, in in this almost like unreal way. Like it it is complete black, and so it's almost like the silhouette of these very kind of gravity defying bat wings around her i was kind mm-hmm. of it was kind of interesting how it looked yeah. um um and so I, when she dies on stage the uh the count does the the ever inconspicuous thing of of uh leaving the theater quietly as like the crowd rushes to the stage and he's just <laughs> in like his box and he he does a cloak swirl and leaves leaves the theater <laughs> um and we find out the count is actually the grand vampire no <laughs> um uh, and then uh, a bunch of other stuff happens in this episode. Uh, Philippe is, is kidnapped, but uh, Mazamet shows back up um, to help him escape. Uh, they, it turns uh, out that Mazamet is a vampire. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then Philippe's like, I can't believe it. You're a vampire. And then he pulls out the same picture of his family. And he's yeah. like, <laughs> my family. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to feed my family with vampire money. That basically happens every episode th- <laughs> thus far. Um, so they do this trick when Philippe is, is kidnapped where they, they, the, the grand inquisitor is going to show up. And so him and and Mazamet grab him and put him in like the, tie him up with the hood, like they had Philippe tied up. And so then when the, the rest of the gang shows back up, uh, they, they bust in with the police. Um, and the, the grand inquisitor is shot in the, in the chaos um, and the rest of the vampires escape, but the the police unmask the, the Grand Inquisitor, and they find out, oh, gasp, it was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. It goes all the way to the top. <laughs> <laughs> also, we find out in this episode that the the sort of leaders, the inner circle of the vampires are called the Black Council. That's rad. Um, and then we're on to our third episode, the Red Cryptogram. Yes, uh, where or Philippe Le Cryptogram is... Rouge. Oui. <laughs> These titles all do sound better in French. Um, <laughs> Philippe is decoding a, a, a an encrypted notebook that he found at the hideout. Um, on, on the corpse of the Grand Inquisitor, which I like. I like how they're really tying one episode to the next. They're they're, yeah. they're making the, the serialization count, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and inside it says the crimes of the vampires are recorded in this book. Woe to those who choose to learn these terrible secrets, which if I ever have, if I ever, I don't have like a physical journal. Um, but if I ever had like a physical diary or something, I would absolutely put that at the front. (laughs) (laughs) But this is what I mean by like bad writing, like having the bad guys just have a, a, like oh i found a list of their crimes and it says yeah. don't yeah. read this it's a list of our crimes <laughs> that's that's awful <laughs> yeah it's, it's it is it's uh it does feel very the um the intricacies of the plots of phantomas are really kind of lost here it's 
it's much more like uh, crime stuff. I don't know. Yeah, it's got some vibes, certainly. Um, uh, so in this one, uh, Philippe is pretending to be sick at home mm-hmm. in um, his PJs. In his PJs, uh, and and they because he's so important, they put out a notice <laughs> in the newspaper that he's putting a pause on his investigation of the <laughs> vampires because he's sick at home. So nobody bother him. <laughs> <laughs> this is where he lives. <laughs> Um, but, uh, while he's sick at home, he, he, he know he realizes that the vampires are spying on him, uh, and looking at his front door at all moments. So he sneaks out of his chimney, um, in disguise, in disguise, and he goes to the howling cat, which is one of the most disreputable cabarets in Paris. Ah, uh, um, great. <laughs> Uh, um, and it seems to be like a, a sort of front for the vampire gang. Yeah. And then um, there we meet um, a character named Irma Vep, which as uh, the, 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 the serial is, is quick to point out is an anagram of the word vampire. Yeah. It's like the town um, of Nilbog. It's a little bit better than that. I mean, it's, a, it's an anagram as opposed to like, Eripmav. Eripmav. What's that? Oh. Vampire that... backwards. Wow, that was quick. How'd you do that? I had the word vampire written down, and I read it backwards. Oh, okay. That um, makes sense. But so Irma Vep is like the the headliner at the Howling Cat. Um, And we see her kind of, I guess, like making a speech to the crowd. I'm not entirely sure what she's supposed to be doing. She's not like doing, like putting on a show or anything at this cabaret. Um. Hmm. Uh, but so the, that ends and, uh, she goes downstairs to the, the secret, you know, vampire part of the, of the howling cat, uh, and plots with the grand vampire, um, to get the notebook back. They make a point of saying that there's other people dancing downstairs in like the vampire hideout. And it, they make a point of saying the grand vampire like doesn't care about dancing. Like that's not why he's there. <laughs> <laughs> he's too um, cool for dancing. The vampires plan to uh, assassinate Philippe when he uh, now that they know exactly where he is, uh, and uh, Irma Vep ends up getting a gig as his new maid. Mm-hmm. Um, and you should definitely trust your new maid when uh, yeah. when you're investigating a crime gang. Um, Philippe she... also almost immediately recognizes her because he was. At the Howling Cat in disguise. So he's like, oh, she's uh, Irma Vep from the nightclub. <laughs> cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess he 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 finds this as an opportunity to uh, try and capture them or, or get gain more intel. Um, so she, uh, you know, is kind of pretending to be his, his maid. And she, um, uh, she, like, tries to poison him. Like she swaps out some some of his vi- some of his nighttime water or whatever, um, <laughs> and uh, and tries to poison him. But he pretends that he's sleeping and he doesn't notice. But she like kind of looks in a mirror behind him. Uh, and um, let's see what else happens. Um, um, so you know he's uh, he's aware that she's one of the vampires and that she's trying to drug him. Um, and so he pretends to go to sleep. And she, you know, she walks in and checks on him. Um, right before this, we should mention there is a scene where Mazamet shows back up. He climbs up the chimney um, and says that he stole a poison pen from the Grand Vampire. Um, That's right. And uh, uh, Philippe's mother is called away uh, on some urgent family business. And Philippe is like, here, take this poison pen. You might need it. Um, so then Philippe is, is uh, you know, pretending to be asleep and... Irma lets uh, one of the, the vampires in the, the hooded costume uh, come in through the window. Yeah, they have um, to be invited in. Exactly. Uh, and he, you know, he, he springs into action uh, and shoots them both with his gun and they fall down. Um, but then he goes to runs for the police. And when they come back, oh, they're just they've disappeared. And he finds out, oh, his gun ha- had blanks in it. <laughs> um, she got so him. Then, 
we 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 see them. We see Irma Vep and the the other vampire escaping across the uh, the rooftops. Um, I do like these shots of like escaping across the rooftops because it's just like people running yeah. across roofs in Paris in 1915, and that's and just cool to see. Doing some good sort of acrobatic parkour lightly, you know. I, I don't people know if climbing, they're really doing parkour. They're climbing, they're like climbing up, climbing up ladders. I look. I've seen Casino Royale. I know what I know what parkour looks like. <laughs> yes, they're cl- they're climbing up buildings and walking on roofs in in cat suits, but it looks it looks good. Yeah. Um. Um. But so then his uh, Philippe's mother is kidnapped. Um. When she goes to check on her, she was called away saying her her brother had been in an accident, and she goes to her brother's house, and his brother's not there. That the the person there is like, oh no, he's fine. Like he hasn't been in an accident. And so she calls a cab, but the cab is at, the cab is actually the vampires, and they take her back to their hideout. And she is forced at gunpoint by uh, a guy named Father Silence, mm-hmm. who is deaf and mute, um, to write a uh, a letter to to Philippe. Um, a letter saying like, "I'm kidnapped, you know, give us back the code book or." or I'll, I'll be killed. That's right. Yeah, they're trying um, to get back the code book, and the reason why they're breaking in is partially to kill Philippe, but partially to get the code book. Yeah. The code book that they wrote down all the crimes in. Um, but so, remember that the mom, though, has the poison pen uh, mm-hmm. that she was given, and so she drops it on the hand of Father Silence, poisoning him, and so he he kind of realizes what's happening, but then he dies, uh, and the mom escapes. Um... It is cool just to see, like, the mom character kind of get, like, an action beat. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think it's it's pretty it's pretty slick. Like, she, I think she pretends that the pen isn't working, and she's like, yeah. I've got one. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then Irma, Irma Vep and the, the Grand Vampire uh, show up to that, that hideout and find Father Silence's dead body and the pen. And they're like, aha, this pen, this is the pen that was stolen. So now they they like they know that there's a mole somewhere in their gang. A vampire mole. Indeed. Uh yeah, I mean there's uh th- these movies are a fun romp, I suppose. Uh yeah. they're uh these ones are pretty brief. The they're 15 to 40 minutes long. Mm-hmm. Uh some of these vampires films get up to an hour and 40, I think, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um uh so I guess we'll be talking about the second half of the vampires next week uh for like a little bit of how it was kind of received at the time uh in in france uh at least at at the time um crime films i guess were not the most highly respected (laughs) they were sort of viewed as as kind of low art um there's a great quote from a critic from when it came out that referred to crime films as obsolete and condemned by all people of taste (laughs) <laughs> Which is a little harsh, I think. Um, People wrote so dramatically back then. <laughs> I know. The other thing that made this made me think about this is like, um, this is th- this ki- is kind of using the term vampire in a, I guess sort of an antiquated way that I wasn't really that familiar with. Of like, um, well, there, there was in 1915 specifically. There was another. There was an American film called a fool there was which sort of popularized the term vamp or vampire f- as a sort of like dangerous woman femme fatale type mm-hmm. femme fatale that that term did exist at this point um uh irma vep i guess is sort of a, a femme fatale archetype um uh but so like the the idea of using the word vampire in that context was a bit more in style when this was coming out huh um which i so thought you think it, it wasn't in reference to i think it is in reference to like ooh they're like dangerous like night people you know uh-huh. they're it is that but i think there's this added uh some added context i think in the time it was like oh vampire is like a lady that you got to watch out for kind of hmm. um which i think is sort of 
exemplified in Irma Vep, whose name is literally just Vampire Rearranged. There's there's even there's like it does it in stop motion where uh, uh, Philippe looks at the sign and like the letters rearrange themselves into the word vampire and then back again. Um, it's, it's kind of fun, a little fanciful touch uh, in this. Yeah. Otherwise, kind of more grounded uh, work. Yeah. Um, but uh, well, yeah, that wraps up uh, the cereal bowl for this it's time week. To, it's time to put this cereal bowl in the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we're gonna do the do these the dumb intros and outros, but. Uh, yeah, so let's uh, welcome back Marcus uh, for our feature presentation. And now we're pleased to bring you our feature presentation. And now, and now we're back. <laughs> <laughs> um, Studio magic is happening. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Where to begin on this thing? On Birth of a Nation. Yeah. Ugh. Ugh. Uh, <laughs> Did I y'all we... like it? Do you think that it's good? <laughs> uh, that is a good place to be. Well, well, yeah, like what? What is your like opinion of it? Just like on its, you know, so, aesthetic basis. I have really different feelings about the first half versus the second half. Sure. Um, yeah, I think the first Same. half is. I think the first half is pretty good. It, it's it's in the style of a lot of previous D W right. Griffith movies where it's. This kind of civil war epic uh, with kind of crossed Union and Confederate uh, yeah. soldiers. He's really interested in this brother on brother conflict or brother yeah. against brother conflict. Hot brother on brother action. <laughs> yeah, oh my god. <laughs> um. Uh. And and it's well done. It's like a well done like action film basically. And then the second part is disgusting. Um. And yeah. uh, I don't think that it's good enough to really make make up for any of that i don't know how do you guys feel so i mean i i i mean i hated this movie before i watched it Mm -hmm. i was like this movie is is garbage but i was like hey you know i gotta i gotta i gotta approach it with an open mind and just like watch it for what it is yeah and yeah for the first half i was like this is kind of just a normal dw griffith movie it's like kind of racist but not you know not not the most racist thing he's ever done by any means um and then yeah the second half is like oof yikes um but i mean there's there's so much talk of this movie being like yeah it's awfully racist but it's like he made a good movie yeah and it's it's not really (laughs) like it's in in the scheme of like D.W. Griffith's other filmography that we've watched up till now, mm-hmm. it's longer and maybe a little bit more elaborate in places. But overall, it, it kind of feels kind of like pretty samey to a lot of his other stuff. Yeah. Um, the the maybe like the most positive thing I can say about it is that it moves very quickly. It's very fast paced. So even though it's three hours long, it it actually, it goes by mercifully quickly. <laughs> a three-hour-long movie in the hands of a lot of other directors at this time would be extremely slow and painful, definitely. Sure. Uh, so, Marcus, this isn't the first time you've seen it, right? No, this isn't the first time. I watched it maybe like when I was like twenty-two or some shit earlier, mm-hmm. whenever I first started like kind of watching movies, you know. Yeah. Um, and I liked it. Um, you know, a thing about me is that I'm just never really shocked by like racist imagery, you know, right. I just like, am you know, like numb to it and it doesn't surprise me that it like pops up, you know? Um, so the first time I watched it, like I saw that and I just like understood like, oh, this shit racist as fuck, like <laughs> this shit mad <laughs> fucking racist, yo. But I, you know, I was just like, you know, whatever. Um, I watched it. Um, but now that I have more, like, especially more, like, context for what's going on and, like, history and, like, its impact, yada, yada, yada. Um, I watched it again. I still kind of like it. I think that, like, it's, I actually like, as far as the filmmaking, I like the second half better. 
than the first half. Really? I think that the I mean of of course it's like incredibly racist, but there are shots and like shit that happened with the camera that uh uh fucked with. Well, yeah. There's those shots where um I don't know, I don't even know how, but like it was like the clan coming like facing the cameras facing the clan coming up the road, you know, those yeah, like shots. Yeah. Those shots were crazy. Like those really stood out to me. Um and at like the very end, like the heaven hell kind of transposition kind of thing. Um, I thought it was kinda cool, but then I watched the hypocrites today and I was like, Okay, like that that she did that part better, so yeah, um, yeah, definitely. But you're uh, talking about like right at the end with the big yeah, mm-hmm. Jesus over the frame, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that just kind of the placement of that is interesting. Like that just kind of was out of nowhere, and it was kind of I, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, that I mean, it was kind of cool, but like it was kind of cool in the way that it was like, oh, like damn, you like not a lot of people were doing shit this elaborate in 1915 with film. So like part of it is me being like, well, okay, like you're like a very competent filmmaker like you knew what the fuck you was doing there's mm-hmm. no like question about that but and then it was funny because i texted i texted you chris um and i was like i don't even know because i don't i don't know anything really about dw griffith i've never seen any of his other movies and i texted you and i was like is he even like really like a racist for his time or is it like a <laughs> is it like a he's you know compared to his time it's whatever and you were like no yes he's pretty fucking racist <laughs> yeah yeah um <laughs> Yeah. It was funny. I texted you that twenty minutes into watching it, and then like maybe five or ten minutes after that, I started to just realize like, oh, this shit, it's it's build is like a I don't know brother on brother kind of thing. It's so it's sympathetic to the fucking South from the very beginning. I don't even yeah. I don't even understand why. I don't think that the the like the the North, you know, we were friends and now we're not friends and all that. I don't I don't believe that adds to anything. I think that's kind of useless. You mean the um like it like like to the narrative it doesn't add anything or to the ideology what do you mean just to the narrative like it doesn't Mm -hmm. i I don't know to me it didn't not that it's not useful in in the narrative itself i just thought it was kind of kind of dumb like (laughs) you know like i think it's kind of i just think it was kind of dumb to like even have that juxtaposition but be so sympathetic only to one side you know in that case In that case, I don't need the, you know, the that deep of a backstory about, you know, the, I forget the names of the families, um, but. The, the Stonemans. Stonemans and the and Camerons. Like the, yeah. I don't, I, I don't need that backstory if you're only going to be, be really sympathetic to one side. And that's, that's a small, like, kind of narrative nitpicky thing, but like. I think know. that's legitimate. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> Like it, it follows in the vein of a lot of his previous short films where um, it does seem like the main issue that he has with the Civil War is like the tragedy of Americans having to fight Americans. And, and yeah. he makes it more explicit in this movie that it's the tragedy of white Americans having to fight other white Americans. Of course, yeah. Um, uh, so he's done other movies that sort of juxtapose a, 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 a Union family and a Confederate family. Uh, and then they clash, and it's tragic in a way. Um, yeah. But he always does sort of end up more on the Confederate side. I think with this movie, it really solidifies that as like, uh, I think, to- oh God, I need to find the quote toward the end where it basically says, uh, the former enemies of North and South are united again in common defense of their Aryan birthright. <laughs> <laughs> DW isn't even pretending anymore. Like, no, it's 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 so it's so pointed. Um, yeah, it's pointed way before that, but yeah, especially towards the end, the title cards. I'm just like, we get it, DW. <laughs> yeah, you know, another thing that I didn't like about it is like I hated the use of you know like some people being in blackface, but then they're also in the same scene being black actors yeah you know i think that that's just like i don't i don't i don't know aesthetically kind of fucked up you know just dumb like pick pick one pick one if you want to <laughs> just have everybody in blackface for sure right or like if you want to get black actors do that but like it just seemed like weird in i don't know weird and violent in a specific way 
to like have you know me act as you know whatever a dumbass slave or some you know demeaning role while mm-hmm. you know me and one other person while there's like 10 other people in blackface around us that just seems strange <laughs> and i don't know why why even include black people in the beginning in you know in the yeah you know in the first place <laughs> it seems like yeah uniquely insulting uh yeah. in a way um my my guess why that is is because it, it seems like the more major characters that get like actual screen time and aren't sure. bo- mm-hmm. like background characters are mm-hmm. people in blackface and then the background characters are actual black people yeah um and so it might have something to do with like the segregation on the film set, which yeah. we have seen a bit of before. Um, and, but also it could just be like, they don't want to, they don't trust or want to like trust sure. black people enough with a big role or want to give them one, you know? Sure. And of course, uh, but I'm just like, come on for the sake of the scene. You know what I'm saying? It, I mean, it's just not have like, your, it, have your aesthetics on point. DW. It doesn't look realistic. Like this movie's right. going for realism, right. and mm-hmm. it's they they have like cartoon characters in it. Right. You know, mm-hmm. that is um, one thing that did strike me about it is how kind of um, over the top a lot of the performances were. Yeah, mm-hmm. mm. especially compared to some of D.W. Griffith's earlier movies. Um, I mean, his whole one of his sort of overblown claims is that he invented subtlety subtlety in acting um (laughs) which i think i have seen applied to this film as well it's like this was the first movie to have subtle acting in it um and it's like how can it's like if you've seen any other movies from the past five years before this it's like this it feels like acting was getting more subtle and then d w griffith was like no no forget about that we're we're going big in this one um and it i don't it's it's it almost like kind of undermines his whole this movie feels like it's trying to be so like important and uh uh sort of dignified i guess um and it's it it feels so cartoonish even for one of his movies i think who who in particular are you thinking about with their acting um Pretty much everyone. Yeah. I mean, particularly, I think, uh, the, like, head of the Stoneman family. That's who I was going to say, too. Who is, like, this villainous uh, uh, abolitionist. abolitionist. <laughs> um, and he is just hamming it up. Yeah. Every day. The The guy who plays Silas Lynch, the, um, the mixed race uh, mm-hmm. lieutenant governor or whatever. Is it's just like everyone in this movie is this whole movie is at eleven. It's like the only direction he would ever give was just be the most intense you can possibly be at every single moment. I you know, I already didn't like this movie, but I think I was struck by how um for all the credit it gets, D D W Griffith has done so many things in this better before. That this almost feels like a step down in in some ways, the performances especially, and it's also more of you know everything dialed up higher in ter- in terms of like length and scope too. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, I think there are a lot of as I mean, D. W. Griffith is not a bad director, um, but uh, it, but he's a, he's a good director. He's just not a, a good person, amazing, <laughs> not a good person. Yes. <laughs> um, but then like you know, it's taking his regular. Uh, style which he usually constrains to 15 or 30 minutes and then blowing it out to three hours uh and then the scope of everything um adjusts as well um i guess also i guess before we get like into more let me like give like a little summary of what this movie is um so there's two families the stonemans and the capulets the cameron the cameron <laughs> the sharks and the jets <laughs> yeah <laughs> Uh, they're from the north, and uh, one, the Stonemans are from the north, and the Camerons are from the south. Uh, they have the the younger people in the families have some kind of like r- romantic entanglements back and forth. Uh, they're visiting each other, and then the war breaks out. Um, they end up meeting on the battlefield, and a lot of them end up dying. Uh, 
the uh the civil war scenes are enormous um and you know pretty entertainingly staged certainly uh the two remaining kids who were involved uh they meet in like as one is injured in the war and they they kind of more thoroughly fall in love but it turns out that like the 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 guy he is a you know this confederate soldier and so he's due to be executed and so uh the stoneman daughter uh goes to abraham lincoln himself to uh ask for forgiveness and uh and abraham lincoln grants it and then uh there's a scene where abraham lincoln goes to the theater and we know how that ends um and then that is the end of the first segment which is the civil war and then the second part is reconstruction the, um there's a uh, a title card that made me laugh which is at the end of that first half it just says end of the first part <laughs> Um, end of the first part of the birth of America. Um, and then in the reconstruction segment, um, you know, basically the movie gets all concerned that black people are getting all of these new rights, that the white South is getting crushed under the heel of the black South, according to Woodrow Wilson. And, and this is quoted in the movie. Um, so they start getting power in the government uh, in the local government, there's this guy, Silas Lynch, which is an extremely bad guy name. Um, and he is a uh, mixed race, like Glenn was saying, uh, lieutenant governor who gets elected. Um, and he's kind of portrayed as sort of aggressive and and uh, and scheming. Um, he's he's basically a supervillain in this movie. Yeah. I was I was watching a PBS documentary about this movie called Birth of a Movement, um, mm. and there's a director Reginald Hudlin, who <laughs> he sounds uh, racist. <laughs> he's black. Um, <laughs> mm, that name though. <laughs> Go on, sorry. <laughs> uh, he was talking about uh, he was talking about the um, the the kind of threatening nature of the mulatto as the villain. And he said mm-hmm, that, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. that, that he has the intelligence of the white man, but all of the evil brutality of the black man. Mm-hmm. Um, right. He, he sort of personifies the, the, the root fear that I think this movie is, is trying to like portray, yeah. which is mm-hmm. in intermixing of the races. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that seems to be the thing that just, terrifies <laughs> D.W. Griffith to his bones. Um, yeah. Like, this movie is so blatantly fearful, too. Yeah. It's like, D.W., it's... It'll be okay. <laughs> like, Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to be this afraid. Silas Lynch is the... is the... is the mixed-race person, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. If it... There's something that I appreciate about this movie being so like egregiously racist and violent because there's there there are those things that like like of course it's egregiously racist and violent but like that was also the time you know and like of course it's like whatever this movie is portraying it was a hundred times worse in real life you know but so that's why I'm like I appreciate that part of it like and even like going so far as to like name. Uh, a mixed race person lynch you know what i'm saying like even that in itself is why is wild you know like and violent on every fucking level you know right so yeah that's so what i was just thinking just about like refreshingly <laughs> honest about it in a way well like I mean, it commits honest yeah honest i mean honest in its like portrayal of like violence and racism not honest in you know the story or Right. You know, like the portrayal of people, you know, but yeah, I mean, it, like it encapsulates a feeling at a time, you know, I think that is like a kind of a perfect capture to be like, OK, like this is what this is what was a blockbuster. This is what people was coming out in droves for, you know, you know, in 1915, you know, this shit made a, like 50 to 100 million or something. It made like a crazy like amount yeah. of money yeah. for the time. Right. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, I mean, on on the one hand, right? Like, we we don't know what life was like in 1915, just right. for people in general. Um, and 
we look at a movie, a racist movie that came out in 1915, and on one hand, we go, uh, you know, we our initial our initial reaction is, well, people were racist back then, that makes sense. But then yeah. we hear like the complicating factor of there were protests against this movie, the NAACP, like yeah. one of the biggest, the earliest big projects they did was trying to block this movie from getting released. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people had problems with it when it came out, but also. On the other hand, people loved this movie. Tons mm. of people went to see it, yep. and a lot of people couldn't see what was wrong with it. Yeah, mm. I mean, also, when was blackface like even phased out as like a mainstream thing that Hollywood was doing? I want to say like the forties or fifty. Mm. Like, I don't actually know, but way later. Yeah, because my 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 instinct is like, oh, the twenties, but I know for a fact that it was later than that. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, I, w- I want to say the 50s. I hope it was that early. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll be getting to it at some point, but yeah. uh, notably... One week. Yeah, in, in uh, 12 weeks, uh, we'll be getting to the jazz singer, Oy. which uh, is the first talkie, but mm-hmm. also has a lot of blackface in it that's the first talkie (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) yes that is hilarious this country is hilarious (laughs) it's a a silly place well now Uh, i'm curious to see if it is the first talkie because there's probably going to be something before that i've seen some experiments uh in in you know short experimental talkie films but I think that was the kind of first widely theatrically released talkie Mm -hmm. at least according to legend or whatever yeah um uh and then the uh so reconstruction thing is a kind of very uh diffuse segment there's like a, there's a lot of different things happening at once but mainly it's just all of this panic over uh uh black people getting uh more representation in government there's this scene that you know the camera is portraying as horrific of uh of all of these uh, black people in the um, the legislature or whatever in South Carolina, and they are like taking their shoes off and drinking and eating fried chicken uh, inside of the. I didn't even building. notice that. Oof. Yeah. Um, and uh, and there are some like horrified white people who are watching from the the second story as they they pass laws to allow. Uh, uh, white people and black people to marry each other, um, which, I mean, I I I just compared Silas Lynch to a supervillain. I feel like the this movie treats interracial marriage like a supervillain plot. It's like if we can just stop mm-hmm. this thing from happening, like everything will be okay. Yeah. Like, but this there's like this like out of control plan that's happening that the hero the heroes have to have to stop yeah um yeah as a as a product of miscegenation i i resemble (laughs) i I resemble that remark (laughs) but (laughs) (laughs) yo me too though and uh so there's this guy there's this um black union soldier in blackface gus who uh sees the daughter of the Oh god, I'm forgetting the, the Cameron the family, Camerons. the youngest the young... daughter of the Camerons. Yeah. yeah. Uh and he sees her in the woods and runs up to her and says and is basically like we can marry now, marry me. Um and she says no and she runs away and uh he chases her through the woods uh implicit with implicitly with the attempt or with the intent to rape her. Um and she walks up to a uh, a cliff and then jumps off um basically rather than be with him in any way or she says like back away or i'll jump that kind of thing be dishonored i think is how it's referred to in the uh in the intertitles mm-hmm. yeah. uh and her brother discovers her body he realizes what happens and that is sort of this inciting incident to reignite the ku klux klan by her brother um, and, uh, they, uh, take off and then they start just killing all the black people. <laughs> just and doing then, hate crimes. And then the move, the rest of the movie is 
basically the uh, the black people who are just scheming and eventually getting on the bad side of even the abolitionists and so the north and the south join together to protect their Aryan heritage and the KKK in this movie are heroes who are and, and portrayed as as almost Marvel-esque heroes mm-hmm. who yeah. are uh, uh, killing all the black people and and then when order is restored uh, they are pointing guns at them as they walk up to the voting booth uh, which is just wonderful. Um, and then we and we end on a, a, a an image of ghostly Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Yo, the, the, another thing that I didn't really fuck with about the movie is like once the KKK was invented, it was the last hour, forty five minutes or something was just all the like, and now niggas is scheming. We gotta yeah. stop, you know, like, and a lot of that shit was just honestly kind of boring, you know, to like. It's pretty one note. Yeah, and it's just like I I don't I don't know. I just feel like Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I get that he wanted to make something on an epic scale, but I just feel like you built all the way up to and then like you built well all the way up to like the birth of the KKK, this whole backstory and then like all to say we got to save the white race, you know what I'm saying? You built all mm-hmm. the way up to this and then the last hour is like, well, now let's just kill niggers <laughs> you know like right and it's just kind of like yeah it's just one note and kind of boring and like i don't I don't know you know do you feel like it kind of it like lost the plot like it became all about all about an idea instead of an idea and just watching murder happen rather than like actual story i guess yeah you know and that's the kind of actually the part that kind of feels marvelous to me like it builds up to this big kind of moment and then there's just like a long you know a long kind of battle scene or kind of like epic kind of clash between you know actors um that i just feel like is kind of unnecessary i'm just kind of like i think it was too my one of my main things is i do think that it's too long and not only because it's just three hours even into my like contemporary brain is too long it just like yeah, there are points that I just was like kind of bored, you know. Also, the I didn't like much of the score, mm. which kept which made me, which is also like wasn't it like the first movie to be like have a you know music written for an orchestra or something like that? I read no. Well, yeah, there's so many claims that this movie's the first of that are yes, not actually true. Yes, please, I, I call honestly, this motherfucker I, I, out. <laughs> the only one that I think is true is that it's the first, uh, it was the longest film ever made yeah, at the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, too, too fucking long, like, <laughs> too fucking long, a bunch of useless scenes. <laughs> yeah. I think the, the like, comparison to marvel movies is is interesting and kind of apt um because uh i I mean i'm stealing this from alan moore um but alan moore said i think in in 2017 that there is a good argument to be made for the birth of a nation being the first american superhero movie (laughs) um i mean it's got it's got masks it's got capes it's got uh you know crime in quotes fighting um, and it's got, you know, this idea of like, uh, people come together to, to, to fight together and like preserve their, you know, their, their greatness sort of, um, I mean, preserve their nation, right? I, I think right. a lot of superheroes yeah. are fighting for saving the, the world. idea of a nation. Yeah. You know? Um, and, uh, I know that the HBO Watchmen TV show kind of minds, that idea a little bit um, of sort of like directly kind of connecting the idea of superheroes with the KKK. Um, and as, I mean, as a big fan of, of superheroes in general, uh, that's uncomfortable, but I have to acknowledge <laughs> that it's, it makes a lot of sense. It's like, yeah, yeah sure. I can, I can see that thread for sure. I think it's a sound argument, honestly. Yeah. It checks all the boxes, if at mm-hmm. the very least. <laughs> yeah. yeah. M- masked Crusaders, right? I mean, mm-hmm. even inspired by the Crusades, probably. I think that I think that it's actually like 
an, an interesting piece of revisionist history is to try to relabel it as kind of a superhero movie because then it would be seen as fantasy, you know, because that's what it is, yeah. you know, like, yeah, I mean, it checks all it checks all the boxes. So like it just is what it is, you know, I like. Yeah, I just had that thought. So I'm just like, oh, <laughs> yeah, I guess to like to treat it as I mean, it's it's historical fiction and it's also historical revisionism because it's right. saying mm-hmm. made up nonsense about the civil war and reconstruction. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I guess to more honestly engage with that by calling it fantasy fiction. Yeah. I think the movie directly tries to make it seem not fantastical. It tries to like really root it in history by doing these sort yeah. of like historical recreation scenes almost. There's there 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 are intertitles that that preface certain scenes that are like this is a recreation of a historical thing like and it like cites what yeah. you know mm-hmm. it like cites uh like a photograph uh or certain things um of like this is a real thing that happened and like this is a scene of Abraham Lincoln signing a thing um i i kind of assume to sort of lend credence to the whole enterprise um even though I feel like the 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 fictional parts, most of it, uh, felt towards the end of it, I started to get this feeling that. So I knew that D.W. Griffith was inspired by uh, Kova Addis and uh, Cab- Cabiria. 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 Yeah. Um, and it it kind of feels like he's applying that. Those those movies are about ancient Rome, mm. and it seems mm. like he's kind of trying to apply a similar logic to reconstruction era America as this like mythic, the like mythic storytelling of those Italian movies yeah. to, to this movie. Um, it, it seems like uh, uh, a reverence for ancient Rome and all of that kind of stuff is, is built into the, the white supremacist um, mindset considering a lot of you know western civilization defenders these yeah. days uh i guess it has a it has a history yeah i mean quo Vadis also has this sort of story of uh like the oppression of of christianity and like christians being oppressed in in rome um, and getting eaten by lions which eaten was by, sick eaten by lions which was awesome um and it it kind of feels like he's trying to apply that that to like reconstruction of like oh look how like white christians were being persecuted because they had to like share the sidewalk um and it's like no dw like (laughs) this 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 uh equivalency does not does not work yeah fuck that nigga (laughs) seriously (laughs) Yeah, I think that he's definitely overrated. Also, I feel like even if he did do shit first, just because you did something first doesn't mean that you did it the best, you know. I think that there's, you know, yeah, just, I mean, there's there's definitely, like, some credence to, you know, putting, you know, the the mood, creating the, the thing first, you know, and, like, doing it and, like, having that vision. But that doesn't mean that you did it the best, you know, he for also- sure didn't really do anything first that's what i'm saying i mean on top of everything you know yeah yeah <laughs> i feel like i feel like now's a good enough time to talk about how much like credit this movie gets and how yeah. undeserving it is of most of it not all of it but most of it i think the this movie is very commonly credited as a lot of things that it isn't um yeah first movie with the original score written for it uh first american feature film i think I've seen it. Mm. Who said that? Yeah, That's what? not true. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm not saying this is like in published journals everywhere, but it's like a lot of things get thrown yeah. at this movie mm-hmm. in praise that are just, you know, completely untrue. Um, and a lot of that, co- I think, comes from D.W. Griffith perpetuating it himself. Yeah. Uh, because I, I saw something that was like, this was the first movie to have close ups. And it was like, no. D.W. Griffith already claimed to have invented that like three years before this movie. <laughs> and he didn't do it then either. Yeah. Um, and so I, I didn't really know how much of that, like before watching it, I was like, we'll see. We'll see how much is like 
how innovative it feels when I while watching it, having like watched all these movies up to this point. And uh, yeah, it kind of feels like just another D.W. Griffith movie in terms of like the technical aspects of it. There are some really striking yeah. images in it, and like yeah. Yeah. some mm-hmm. really w- it's it's I think it's very well edited as as most of his films tend to be. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like Cabaria does Cabaria also doesn't do that many things new. But I think that felt like it was pushing the medium forward to a much greater degree than uh, maybe. Than this. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, some some of these movies are advance in technique, and some of them advance in uh, just actual quality. Like I think that this is a better movie than Cabaria, uh, which is the is Italian movie we watched last week. Cabaret is boring. Like it's it's for I don't find for, I didn't find it boring. <laughs> for the type of movie it it is, which is a 1910s Italian epic, it's the best one that we saw, but it is still a lot more boring than this movie. I feel like yeah, you, you that's can That's true. You know, <laughs> you can you can pay attention a lot easier with this one. Um but it's but it 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 made some bigger strides in uh, in technique and a little bit in scope that this movie didn't. Yeah. Uh, for sure. I think the thing that this movie gets credit for that is is true, but maybe not necessarily in the way that it is always intended, um, is its, like, impact, its, like, cultural impact, and its, its example as, like, uh, the power of, of film, of, like, the power of movies. For sure. Um, this movie had an insanely oh mm-hmm. profound sure. impact on the world in one of the worst ways possible. <sighs> That's a fact. <laughs> um, Chris, I know I, I sent you this article, but there was a, a Harvard University paper uh, by a guy named Desmond Ang that was published last year that as as like empirically as anything can be proved with like movies' cultural impact he basically goes through and proves how this movie was in large part responsible for the, uh, the revitalization of the KKK in the 20th century and just in an increase in general racism and hate crimes. Yeah. Um, throughout uh, like every, every place the movie screened because it's screened as a road show, every County, the movie screened at would have a, uh, a like five times spike in hate crimes in the months mm. afterwards um and Jeez. even even like into the 21st century the counties that this movie screened in still have a higher like a, a disproportionate amount of kkk activity and hate crimes like this movie permanently made places more racist that it screened in I guess that speaks to the power of cinema, huh? Not Just... permanently, I guess, but like the 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 impacts this movie had on American culture are still very like felt and and real. I almost feel like it didn't even make places more racist. Like to me it's like how can you like uh, even understanding like the sentiment it was trying to give out about black people, right? How can you see this movie where it's all white people in blackface and you know this as a as a viewer of this? You know, how can you how can you see that and then turn around and be mad at black people when there were literally no black people in the movie? You know, like there's some kind of weird disconnect to me for in that. And so I almost feel like you you it didn't you know, like people were already there they were just looking for an excuse you know what i'm saying because yeah you know like and that just i mean that just speaks to what the the fucking country is i mean the fact that it sold you know that it did so so fucking well also you know like just compounds to be like you know and just as a like a continuing example of the country was always like this. It's always fucking racist. It was always, you know, there's always some shit like this going on. Um, and it's just good to keep that in like kind of historical perspective, you know? So I guess you see it more in the way that, uh, 
uh, rather than making more people racist, Donald Trump, for example, just like made people feel okay being racist out in the open or, or activated people or galvanized people uh, in a similar way to this movie. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Oh, but we were talking about the advances. Um, I wanted to ask you, Marcus, about um, your kind of like history with silent films and like early films and how this compares to some of the other ones you've seen. I feel like I haven't seen too, too, too many silent films. I was thinking like, you know, like the earliest films that I remember, like have fresh memories of are probably in like the 30s, the late 30s or early 40s. Mm -hmm. Um, And when I was younger, um, it was harder for me to to have that kind of attention, you know, or like care for silent films. But I think like... Does it, how does it compare to like other other silent films that I've seen? Period, or like up to this point, or like after this point? I, I guess in general, uh, to lump this era all together, you've seen um, you've seen Caligari, right? I love Caligari. Yeah, that's my shit. Yeah, yeah. That was what year was that? That was nineteen twenty. Nineteen twenty. Yeah. 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 That's five my shit. episodes from now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that shit. I mean, Caligari is miles better than. Birth of a Nation, I think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, But I think that it, I mean, it definitely stands out in scope for for sure. It felt like, I mean, just I had that thought while I was watching Birth of a Nation, like, yo, he had to hand cut this shit. <laughs> like, he, yeah. you, he had to, like, really fucking put in work to physically edit this shit. And so, you know, there's, there's some shit that you just gotta be like, yo, I gotta, I gotta t- tip my hat to you if you like hand edited this shit, like, and so, yeah, I was, I think that the editing is great, you know, I think it's some of the yeah. best editing I've seen in like a silent movie, um, for sure, and again, my like knowledge generally is, is, is softer for, for the silent era, but, um, and I think that some, another thing that stuck out is some of the, like the tense in it, I really liked like the red for fire tent you know when she was on fire Mm -hmm. was was really nice and him you know kind of because i had seen and i don't know if this is prevalent but i had seen other you know movies do like the yellow for daytime blue for nighttime kind of green if you're out in a natural setting kind of thing but i you know like the red for fire was just kind of like i don't know a nice kind of emotional affectation to the scene you know um, yeah. and there was a point, I think this was right before like the Jesus he seen, like in the last few minutes, there was a point where one frame was like a different color of like this reddish pink. There was, I can't, I can't even remember the context of what was in the scene, but I think some of the way he's played with those tints worked out in like an interesting way. Um, and yeah, more, liked- more extensively than other silent films. Cause it's usually just like the blue night, yellow day that I, that I've seen. Right. I, I thought it was interesting too how it took me a while to pick up on this in watching it that um, he was contrasting, especially in the first half, the um, the northern people with a just straight black and white, and mm. then the people in the south with a yellow tint. Yeah, um, that's true. And then yeah. even when the people from the mm. north came into the south, uh, their scenes in the south were in black and white, and then mm. everyone else was was in mm. yellow. You know, very interesting. Uh. Yeah, it was even it even applied to the title cards or the intertitles, mm. um, where the the intertitles that were spoken by the southern people had a yellow tint to them, uh, trying to make it seem I don't know nice and rustic and homey. Yeah, uh, he he talks and at some point about um, you know the the uh, I don't know the the peace the peace and and tranquility of the South and the perfect state of the South that never will be again after all of this terrible stuff (laughs) but yeah i think that that kind of tent play is 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 interesting um and i think that it's just yeah because i I think that that just shows kind of your and and i don't i don't know i mean this will be interesting going into um the hypocrites but i don't know any of like other like auteurs kind of that time so i don't know other directors who i don't know of like the the filmography of other directors but yeah, I think that that he just like kind of understands kind of all pieces of filmmaking, you know, and he like understands how 
how it can emotionally affect the viewer, you know, um, in like a yeah. prof- in a profound way. Um, even down to like, yeah, like who's speaking, what color they get, you know, what's happening in the scene, what the color of the tint is, you know. I think that that is, I mean, honestly, kind of just impressive. There is a lot of technique sure. in this movie, yeah, for sure. Strictly technique, impressive, you know, on, yeah. on those fronts. Yeah. Although uh, I, uh, I, I mean, I want to say again, I was, I was kind of disappointed by the technique. I think, I think I was expecting a little, a little bit more. Considering how highly people talk about it, yeah. Yeah, I think especially after watching Cabaria uh, last week. Did D.W. Mm-hmm. Griffith do Cabaria? No, that was a an Italian uh, epic that came yeah. out in 1914 that he supposedly watched. Uh, I'm not sure if it was before or after this movie, because I, I think he later said that uh, Intolerance was inspired by that movie. Mm-hmm, yeah. um, but it... I don't know it it that one to me was the sort of thing I was like oh damn I didn't realize this stuff was being done this early yeah um mm-hmm. and and it really has uh it just has like enormous sets and a lot of camera movement um and I don't know I was I was just in, in, impressed by it um whereas this I was like all right let's see it. And I was like, this is this is the same. This is just him like having women stuck in a room and like people trying to get in over and over. There's <laughs> I, I think there's three or four scenes, which is yes. a woman is stuck in a room. Yes. Yes. And people are trying uh-huh. to get in. Yes. And it's like <laughs> we get DW. Stop. You've made the yeah. same movie like 25 times. No, literally, Marcus, that you might that not so be aware funny. of this, but um, like one of his earliest hits was this movie called uh, The Lonely Villa, which is about some women stuck in a room and some bad guys trying to get in. Uh, <laughs> and he re- he remade that movie in different contexts like five times or more. That's yeah. fucking um, funny. So. <laughs> With some of the same actors as in this yeah. movie. like See, and, uh, that, and like knowing that, I have less respect for him maybe as like an auteur, you know. I mean... I feel this kind of, and we don't have to get into this deeply, but I feel this kind of same way about, and take this for how you will, but like like Wes Anderson, like I think Wes Anderson makes the same, has been making the same movie since 2000, honestly, you know, mm-hmm. same actor, same character, same situation, same emotional things he's trying to bring out, but his techniques are good and like his sets are nice and like the direction is good, you know, and that way it kind of reminds me of that where it's like, well, how much, mm. I, I, I don't know, like. You, I guess you are an auteur because you know in that way because you have a singular vision and like a complete kind of portfolio of you know ideas and aesthetic you know and philosophy of your work, but I don't know I, I'm I want to be surprised. Like a more versatile director. I just want to be so not su- like surprised like you you have to do a completely different genre every film, but I want to see well you know like one of my things is just because I want to see people take risks, you know, I want to see that yeah. like, you know, okay, I got this type of movie down. I got this type of direction down. I can build this type of set. What else can I do? How can more, can I tweak this instead of just being kind of complacent and being like, you know, and just kind of rehashing it, you know, that's kind of, that's right. boring to me, you know, and I feel like I'm less interested in all tours to do that and more interested in people who try to, you know like push themselves in some way um i don't really like fucking james cameron m- movies you know what i mean they're fine but like the fact that he tries to invent new shit literally you know to yeah. do mm-hmm. shit you know in front of his movies i respect i respect that like okay you know i've done the biggest you know production in this way you know and i made the shit for this camera or, you know did all this shit mm-hmm. Let me, i want to like push that. i want to do more you know i want to like you know I pre you know, and regardless if it like works kind of out in that way, I always appreciate that kind of that kind of effort, you know, from all kind of artists and mediums, you know. That's and, definitely true. Yeah. Like it's 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 so much. I mean, uh, I, I that's that's something that I think is neat about hypocrites is that I feel like it is going for something pretty wild for uh, sure. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, and it's not it's not trying to be normal, <laughs> which which I think I can respect yeah. a lot. I watched um, Hypocrites. Yeah. 
I guess are we, are we transitioning to hypocrites now? Does does anybody have anything else on Birth of a Nation? Nah. I have a bunch of like small grievances with it. <laughs> um yeah. I mean I have I have a near endless have list of pages. grievances. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. I have pages more way more about like its negative impact on on society. I have more about it's just like some of its like more dumb decisions as a film. Um but eh. <laughs> I think we've I think we've dunked on this movie enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's uh move on to Hypocrites from Lois Weber. I watched this the same day as uh The Birth of a Nation and it I was like now this is a real picture. <laughs> yeah. I was I was uh all, all of my frustration with it being kind of Birth of a Nation being more derivative than I expected. I was like, see, this is how you, this is how you try new things. Yeah, because I feel like this movie is yeah. is very kind of experimental and uh, for sure and wild. I guess I'll 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 give a, a quick summary again. Is that um, this movie is kind of told across two timelines uh, or, or two at two at two times? Uh, there's sort of ancient medieval times, and there's an ascetic priest or uh, 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 named Gabriel, Mm -hmm. and he's making a statue uh, about the concept of truth with a capital T, um, and he's keeping it secret from all the other other people and all the other clergy in his group, and he... uh, They they allow him to unveil it in front of everyone. And um, in, in some of the earlier shots you see him take the veil off of the statue and it's like a light comes off of the statue and, and it almost like drives another, when, when another clergy member sees it almost, it kind of drives him insane for a second. Yeah. Um, the truth. Yeah. Uh, he, they unveil the statue and it is of a naked woman and it is the naked truth. And, uh, all of the people are horrified um, some some are kind of fascinated and some start throwing rocks um, and all of the, the people end up uh, killing him uh, over this. They think he's so like sacrilegious and, and offensive that he dies um, and he's portrayed very piously. It's kind of like a Christ-like death. Um, and then there is uh, a modern day scene uh, in 1914 with all the same actors playing different roles. Uh, Gabriel is now a a minister in like a church in a city. And uh, he's trying to give a sermon on hypocrisy. Uh, Like nobody's really paying attention. He uh, discovers a, one of the other clergy members who is like reading a tabloid newspaper about this, this painting that in France called La Verite which mm-hmm. is of a naked woman. Um, and there was a, a kind of similarly horrified reaction to the painting. And it's, it's a real painting, and it's based on, like, a real... Um, uh, th- th- this movie is, in sort of, is sort of based on that painting. Hmm. Um, yeah. He falls asleep, and then he kind of goes into this mixed world between the present day and the past with a lot of like kind of allegorical um interactions between these different members which we can talk talk about in more detail uh and then he he meets he goes through the gates of truth uh and he meets a a a naked woman who is portrayed in a double exposure almost like a ghostly way uh and she is truth and she and the two of them go around turning her mirror at other people and showing them their hypocrisies and, and the light of truth, basically. <laughs> I'm wondering now if I watch a different cut of this than you did, because the structure of the one that I watched was very different from that. Did it start with the um, the modern day? Yeah. Ah, that is, yeah, that is a an older version of the movie. And the the one that they that they released... That that uh, that I watched is um, a reconstruction that is based on summaries of the time. I think they they got like the scenes mixed around in the other print. Wow, damn, yeah. interesting. 
I saw the yeah, one that it, Chris it, saw. It plays very differently the way I watched it, where it's the the modern day stuff is almost like a framing device for all of the, uh, the sort of medieval era stuff, including the mm-hmm. the walking around with the mirror. Um, Which one did you say you saw, Marcus? I saw the one that you saw. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, you watched it on YouTube, Glenn? No, I watched the one that that you gave me. Wait, what? <laughs> I think. That's weird, because I watched the one that I gave you. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Uh, yeah, I w- so when I watched this, I wasn't sure if this was the right decision to do, uh, but I watched it, but I like wanted to soak in all of the um, context, but I watched it with the commentary on the first time, which gave a whole bunch of context of like the formal stuff going on mm. and the kind of uh, religious references that were happening mm. in, in the movie. Yeah. Um, uh, though it was a little distracting from me, like kind of getting emotionally invested. Uh, but he he talked about the different cuts and how like this is the more recent cut from a c- couple years ago. Hmm. The more recent cut being the one that is more accurate to its original form. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um. What are some, what are, your, what are some of you guys' thoughts about this movie? I love the mirror shit. Yeah. Like the mirror shots were like she flipped over and it was like the mirror and like the whatever the hypocrisy transposed in the mirror. I thought those shots were amazing. Like that shit yeah. stood out way to to me actually way more than shit in Birth of a Nation for sure. Like like as a as a kind of cinematic technique, you mean? Yeah. Hmm. Like I had definitely not seen something like that before I felt like, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, think, I, I, like, I, I felt like I was watching something fresh, for sure. I mean, even like the the trans the uh, transposition of like the the nude on those things that was amazing too. Like, you know, and that, like I said earlier, like I had that very last two kind of minutes of Birth of a Nation where it's like the heaven and hell Jesus uh, transposition, whatever. Um, I thought that was cool until I watched The Hypocrites and I was like, oh, like, she did this in a much more interesting kind of way that, like, is important to the narrative and not just, like, a kind of a weird, cool thing that happened, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, uh, those techniques, like the, um, the mat that is around the mirror and the, um, double exposure, uh, those have been used for a long time uh, since the 1890s mm. uh maybe not the 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 mirror but the mm. the figure yeah. mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. she did some interesting stuff with it where she moved the camera i believe while the figure was in the shot which does seem very tough uh, yeah, it does yeah. seem new um but uh <laughs> i feel like i was cheating in a way because the guy in the commentary was like almost like saying just like this is what the art means you know yeah. <laughs> but uh but he was um he was talking about how uh this movie was using these filmic techniques to portray uh th- these like story th- these entities in the story like he he called the um he called the the truth uh the truth nude a uh, like a cinematic creature, right? Mm. She is something that exists in cinema. And I think this is her trying to use cinematic techniques to tell a kind of more poetic, artistic story, uh, and specifically using those techniques. Yep. Yeah. Um, not to keep bringing it back to the movie that we didn't like, um, but like I can see why The Birth of a Nation was like this, the, the big hit, like it's a it's like an action war movie, sure. And this movie is, in comparison, very heady and a- allegorical. Yeah. But it does feel like a much more. It feels like more, I guess, of a sort of like artistic achievement, or a like for sure. You know, uh, pushing the medium forward. But you know, if 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 both of these movies were playing in a you know in side by side theaters, I'd, you know. It makes sense that people would go see like the racist war movie as sure. opposed to this like weird allegorical like n- naked ghost woman movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um even if this one's way better. I like I like that this movie like 
I, I feel like I haven't seen a movie that's about stuff as much as <laughs> this one is yeah. so far, you know? Like, this one is about, you know, trying to be a good person, trying to look at yourself honestly, and and also, like, trying to quest for some kind of godliness and, and the, um, the troubles of that. Uh, all of the people, like, being all worldly and everything... Uh, and and rejecting the truth when it's held up to mm-hmm. them. Uh, a quote that I I really liked in this one was that when they're going through showing the mirror to different people and sort of like re- showing their own truth back to them. Um, there's I think there's a an intertitle that says society. Yeah. Um, and mm-hmm. there's a bunch of of you know, with rich folks in tuxedos and smoking cigars yeah. and such as as we see in a lot of these early films, um, wearing a lot of feathers. Uh, and the, the priest says like, it's trying to bring truth to them. And one of the society women says, truth is welcomed if clothed in our ideas. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, that's a good, that's a good line. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I mean, it's like, it applies both to the physical nakedness of the character of truth and also the idea of like. If we if we dress up the truth in enough of our ideas, then you know, sure, we're we're cool with it. Right. Yeah. That's and also, just like you know, tell us tell us the hard truth, but make it easy for us to listen to. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know. Yeah. Um. Or or I mean, if you were to take this in a Catholic sense, I believe she's Catholic, considering her rosary movie from last year. Mm. Uh, it might be about um, uh, a sort of more modern interpretation of Catholicism where you do sermons in English and not Latin and uh and versus the kind of real deal classic Catholicism that, you know, hates Protestants mm-hmm. and and Jews and uh yeah. and uh only does sermons in Latin, you know. <laughs> yeah. I really I really like the juxtaposition between like the medieval shit and the modern day shit as a like a way of highlighting ways in which like hypocrisy and kind of corruption you know and like you know Mm. like power how those things you know kind of permeate in different ways in the culture and how they're similar you know how how it's different situations but still very similar you know what i'm saying um and just kind of how like the idea of you know corruption and you know hypocrisy is kind of a universal human thing you know where it's like you know I don't know like I think about how funny it is that every government is corrupt you know like every government you know every government is fucking its citizens over in some way um and Uh it's just like that's just like a function of it because it's ran by people you know and so like if people are involved something about it is going to be corrupt you know and so that's how that's how I was kind of reading hypocrite just like no matter kind of what time place you're in these kind of Thing. And even if your ideals are different, these kind of things are like ever present, you know, these kind of human mm. shared evils, you know. Yeah. And it really like hammers that point home by not just like juxtaposing old and new next to each other, but then in the kind of final scene, it's a mix of, you know, old, old time Gabriel and new human beings like yeah. the two worlds are kind of mixing together that was the that was at the beginning of the one that i watched <laughs> that's weird <laughs> so fucking funny. yeah him like going up up the mountain yeah to, mm. to find truth is yeah the first thing that happens after the the modern priest goes to sleep damn that's like the beginning of his dream i can see okay so i can see a historian who's looking at the movie without documentation about how it actually went thinking of thinking that as a dream sequence right so you dream of truth and then you sculpt her or you dream you dream of uh of being in olden times you meet truth then you sculpt her and then die and then you die in real life i think that does kind of make sense that it would be put together that way yeah i mean it it structurally the movie made sense to me i was like oh yeah i i get why it's in this order so i'm i'm really curious now to to watch the uh the more accurate the original cut as it were I'll send uh, it to you. The final cut, the Snyder cut of uh, of him. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, sorry, uh, I just wanted to say that I thought that there was some sort of unintentional comedy with one scene where uh, 
truth is showing the mirror to people and there's there's two kids one of them has a book that just says sex on the cover yes that and the other kid is eating that <laughs> eating a, a big box of candy that just says indulgence on it yes that shit and i was, was like hilarious. what a life that would be <laughs> the subtlety of a political cartoon <laughs> yeah Yo, pretty and, much and shout outs to the the sex book it was a gigantic fucking book yeah like, it, was it really sex. really <laughs> yeah it was yeah <laughs> An enormous, almost like, yeah, like I couldn't, I couldn't believe that shit. It's so funny. A tome. A tome. Um, yeah. You know, what are, what are her other movies like? So cool. she's pretty new. So we've only watched a couple of yeah. her movies. Uh, she started like two years ago. Um, yeah. And I feel like this is really confident for someone who's only been making movies for two years. Yeah. Um, Suspense was super confident. And that was yeah. like right mm-hmm. off the bat. Yeah. Last year uh, in 19... 19- Oh, was it 1914 or 1913? It was 13, I think. Oh, that's right. Okay, so she's been doing it for three years. Um, in 1913, she made this movie called Suspense, which I would I would recommend you check out. It's mm-hmm. like 15, 10 or 15 minutes long, and it is super stylish. Like, uh, like there are some weird noir camera angles in mm. there uh, that I, I was astounded to see in a movie from 1913. Yeah, cool. Um, and it's super tense, too. Yeah true it's, to the name it's it's lois weber's take on the woman trapped in a room movie <laughs> yeah it's based on the same french play as the as the dw griffith movies Very uh next year um she i was reading into this a little bit but i haven't looked at it yet because i only look at one year at a time <laughs> but uh in 1916 she's she makes a movie uh that is about abortion mm, um i saw that too it, yeah, and it's um, I, it seems like to come down as a sort of like pro contraception but anti abortion movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's and it's like explicitly based on one of the early Planned Parenthood people and and sort of stuff that happened in her life, I think, or or at least like riffing off of a lot of those ideas. So I, I'm excited to watch that. It's yeah. interesting. That's interesting. I'm glad you know, like that's a person to her. Like I, I saw. Um, hypocrites and I saw I thought of an auteur you know like I don't I didn't think that thinking of of D.W. Griffith you know I thought of somebody who was a very sound filmmaker but with with hypocrites it was just like a whole other league to me just of like the idea that she was trying to pose in the film on top of like the techniques like the techniques and the idea and like how she did it all kind of was one thing you know what I'm saying and it like all works Mm -hmm. together in this like nice package um, and I like that it's, um, I mean, so, so many things I like that, like her being a female director, her, like having the nude in there kind of like reclaiming as like the first non pornographic, um, nude in a, in a film or whatever the stat is, um, just had like having that, like having her being the person to be like, I'm going to like present the female body, you know? as in like you know and it's complete in, as the naked truth you know and like yeah. just that that element of, of it too like just kind of hammers home like the point in the film even though the 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 point of it being just like a, a naked woman that wasn't the point that she i think that she was trying to do it but like that statement in itself her being the director that she is and like having a non-pornographic nude prominent in the film i think is like a strong political statement and especially knowing because i saw that too like the 1916 she has a movie about um abortion um and just that like she like her like her like yeah she's really like dw griffith you know he's he's kind of just riffing off of a book that was written you know and like some kind of romantic you know idea and like lois weber has like real ideas that she's trying to like work out and like argue for yeah. you know what i'm saying yeah 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 yeah. it's really impressive um i think that uh you know there's a there's another early woman filmmaker the first mm-hmm. one actually elise guy Blaché, um mm-hmm. and um she has made movies sort of about about feminism about gender mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Uh, a good bit um, she has this movie called this comedy movie called The Results of Feminism, which is <laughs> the consequences uh, of feminism. The consequences of feminism, <laughs> which is like this kind of this kind of tongue in cheek alternate future, alternate present where uh, men are like 
acting all kind of demure and doing laundry and women are these kind of like hard drinking mm. uh, smoking like like yeah They're just going yeah. to the bar smoking like pushing people around yeah. that's fucking funny. yeah um and so that's also interesting coming from a, 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 f- a woman filmmaker yeah. i think that yeah they can access these issues in a lot more nuanced and interesting ways than any of the dudes are for sure which are yeah. just kind of making like i feel like the closest thing that that uh that the men make to movies about like dealing with like women related gender stuff are like uh uh the like white slavery movies yeah. oh yeah are couple, that are just like they're about they're about like you know the tragedy of of women being abducted and being sold into prostitution, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. but like and like it's got like a sort of female perspective, but it's this very like victimized one sure. and and almost like from a male perspective, uh, uh, like someone who needs to be saved kind of thing. You know? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So I'm glad Lois Weber is doing some more complex stuff. I was gonna say, and Lois Weber's acting is much more subtle than than. Um the shit in birth of a nation you know like that's the whole thing about birth of a nation and like you know it galvanizing racism to to me too is like you can clearly like it's it's all ham i mean the fucking the um stonewall i I don't know stoneman dude he had a pouty face the entire time he stuck his bottom lip (laughs) out the entire movie you know this shit is a you know what i'm saying like yeah that's just like not as a director as like an artist you, you have like no care in your characters you know or and that just makes me feel like you don't have any care in the narrative you know what i'm saying like Mm -hmm. like just as a in in an aesthetic level like you know it's just like a dude movie it's just like war you know and saving the day and like you know okay props you know i mean everybody's 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 a prop you know like yeah and i feel like the in that in that way like the characters are flat like no character i feel like in a in birth of a nation is a a, a well thought out character you know what i'm saying yeah yeah like just true. just as a just as a character i can't identify and, it, and i was even thinking this like it was that's why it's even kind of hard for me to keep the some of the names straight not only cuz there's a lo- just a lot of characters but it just like nobody made an an impression you know in the acting yeah. or in like in in the way they're portrayed or their story where i think as lois weber like gabriel was a defined character you know all her particular characters were well defined and there wasn't like this sense of ham you know like and maybe they're you know, maybe parts were a little, you know, melodramatic, you know, but it's mm-hmm. not, I mean, it's definitely not what we would consider acting today, you know, but I think that she takes particular care in her characters, you know, and like all parts of the film are like well thought out, like all the shots, all of like the way that they're acting, all like just everything I feel like is well executed and that to me is a better director because it's like and not to even compare like one is better who like who cares she doesn't need the dw griffith comparison to legitimize her you know what i'm saying yeah, but just right. in comparison of the two movies that came out in the same year she just is like she she has a technique and like all the shit that he is doing and the fact that she can like parse down a story like that to 45 49 minutes while it also like having this really interesting like back and forth kind of parallel timeline you know even that s- kind of scope maybe it doesn't go year by year but like she's thinking you know in thousand year gaps you know what i'm saying that's a big as big yeah. of a scope and idea as like you know birth of a nation so i feel like she just is like she's kind of more in control she knows how to tell a story more concisely and that just makes it more interesting you know she doesn't need to give you all this pointless background and build this love story in you know what i'm saying to try to Mm -hmm. give her idea this kind of epic scope she can just kind of put you in two time places you know and juxtapose juxtapose the narrative in a way that you know will have you thinking in this kind of broad range for sure well put yeah yeah um, um we should probably end on that but um the one, however the only, other, <laughs> the only the only other thing i i feel like i want to say about this movie is that um 
between this and uh, suspense, I it feels like Lois Weber is playing with like eye level and POV and subjectivity a lot more than a lot of other directors at the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Suspense especially, but I notice it here also of having like the camera being above or below eye level depending on where the characters were placed. Yeah. Um, which is something that I realized I have barely seen any of up till now. I mean, suspense has a lot more of it than this of like looking out the window mm-hmm. straight down at the, the, the tramp. Um, but this, I mean, in the, in the opening for me, the opening scene, um, of, uh, of the priest in, in the, the modern church, it's like, he's looking down at the, the people mm-hmm. in the, in the audience in mm-hmm. the pews mm-hmm. and it's yeah. shot from above. Yeah. And they, they're looking up at him. Um, I don't know. It's just like, I feel like Lois Weber kind of understands that of like where the POV should be coming from. Yeah. Um, yeah as he's opposed to he's always kind of... very like, like isolated in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, like he's set apart from a lot of people in, in eye line and in blocking mm-hmm. uh, in, in the movie. Um, which I guess it, it kind of helps illustrate him as this prophet type person who no one's listening to. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it you, you can definitely feel his sort of isolation throughout the whole thing. Speaking of that scene too, where he's looking down on the pews, that reminded me too, like of a thing that I was really impressed by with um, Lewis Weber's filmmaking is in those scenes I'm thinking specifically the scene where he's looking down at them in the pew and it's kind of tracking and showing like people kind of talking to each other like whispering secrets to each other and the scene where the naked truth statue is unveiled and that like shot of like what the crowd is doing everybody Mm. in in those shots is like nobody's static you know where and not to even you know I'm just because I watched you know both these movies like D.W. Griffith his characters in the background besides the war scenes like you know i'm thinking just like the the characters in blackface they're often like the mammy character who's always outside on the porch in the um whatever the people's name house is um they she's just always kind of standing and kind of like looking around like looking around and like the characters just kind of not doing anything so like the scenes aren't dynamic where in um the hypocrites it's like the the like the panning of the shot it's like it's bringing it's telling you a little bit about what's actually going on in the scene you know and like what you know i just was especially like the scene where it was um the naked truth scene or statue was unveiled or like the crowd reactions that was incredible to me because like you kind of get stuck on you you have that problem when you're getting stuck on a few people and you but you realize that the camera's moving and there's so much going on that you like, but not in like a distracting way, but it's just like, you know, the first time, the very beginning, I got stuck on the one person who just kind of was like the woman who just kind of like looking at it and like kind of nodding their head and kind of like reposition herself and looking at it. And I got stuck on her until mm. it had gone past her. And then I had seen, you know, like other people just kind of animate, you know, doing something like grabbing a family member or shielding them or like whispering to somebody or getting a rock to throw and like, those scenes are like so dynamic that um and this probably i mean i don't i don't have very many you know memories of films you know around this time but like that's some of the most just dynamic i mean i would even say to you know standards of today's filmmaking like like everything in a, in a scene is like so well curated like everybody has a job to do she has a vision of everything down to like what the extra is doing you know and mm, that to me it's really rich it's so rich yeah. and it's like it's like so like fun to watch because it's just like it's just yeah it's just dynamic like i couldn't i couldn't believe it and it just kept me it kept me in it you know and i feel like specifically thinking now um of going back and looking at silent movies that kind of like dynamicism is is what can like really hold an audience you know like to me well i'm just speaking to me that will really hold me you know um whereas like i was falling asleep in parts of birth of a nation um and just i mean all silent movies because you know i got adhd and you know you know it's silent and you know it's less action than i'm used to in a moving whatever but yeah, those parts stuck out to me because I just like couldn't take my eyes away, and I was like, "Yo, she, 
And like it was moments like that that I was like, yo, I really need to like see what else that she's doing. You know, like I have respect for her as a as an artist for real. And I'm like, oh, I want to see if you were doing this, especially knowing that this is kind of like early in her career. Like, oh, if you're doing this, you know, a couple movies in, I really want to see like what you ended up, you know, rocking with. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. well. I guess that could wrap it up. Um, so, Marcus, if you uh, ever want to come back and talk about any Lois Weber movies or anything else, Caligari or something like that, mm-hmm. you're definitely welcome. I'm down. Um, uh, I guess uh, people can find you at Marcus Scott Williams. Um, Marcus Scott Williams. Yes, on Instagram. At, uh, on Instagram. Uh, you haven't been on there in a while, and I miss your Instagram. But that's uh, okay. I still exist as a person. <laughs> yeah, but you still exist as a person. I can text you, but the people uh, who are listening cannot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Don't. Anyway, listeners, follow- don't text me. But I appreciate. I appreciate your support. <laughs> I mean, we we do usually put the guest's phone number in the episode yeah. description, mm-hmm. but I will hold off in this case. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> um. And uh, you can, if, if you're in New York City or uh, Kansas City, you can check out his art installations mm-hmm. that are coming soon. Yeah, this and year. And you can buy his book, right? You can still buy your book, right? Yeah, Sparse Black Whimsy is the name of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, thanks a lot for uh, for coming on, Marcus. I really appreciate it. Anytime, yeah, thank my you. man. Yeah, for sure. Nice to meet you, Glenn. Peace. See you soon. All right. Uh, we've got one final uh, feature film to talk about, and that Indeed. is The Cheat. The Cheat. The it's, Cheat is grounded. <laughs> it's it's impossible to watch this movie and not think about Homestar Runner cartoons, <laughs> because it's called The Cheat. Yeah. Uh, and for anyone unfamiliar, The Cheat is a character in Homestar Runner cartoons. Yes. If you don't know what those are, then Google it. Anyway, this is not Homestar Runner. No, this is Cecil B. DeMille's film, The Cheat. Not The Cheat. The cheat. Um, so the... Uh, I mean, I guess right off the bat, the the surviving version of this movie is actually the 18, 1918 re-release, which changed... Didn't actually change the film, but changed some of the intertitles and some of the uh The insert context. shots as well. Yeah. Um... It changes the nationality of one of the lead characters. Uh, originally, Hishuru Turi, um, from Japanese to Burmese, and his name to Haka Arak- Arakau. Yeah. Um, because when this movie got come out, came out, it got a lot of flack for villainizing a Japanese character. Mm, rightfully so, in a lot of ways. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's funny. This movie shares a lot of similarities with A Birth of a Nation, The Birth of a Nation, in some ways. Um, in that it is about it is about a v- villainous person of color who is threatening to rape a white woman, uh, and then she like tries to escape by threatening suicide. Um, yeah. That th- uh, those two scenes are weirdly very similar. Yeah, uh, I will say, though, though it is one of the earliest Asian characters in cinema. Um, I don't think he is necessarily like hyper uh, uh, stereotyped. No, I, like he, he is. He's played by a Japanese actor, first of all. Yeah, I think already. The bar is low, but like already, that's like a step above. Yeah, he's played by um, he's played by oh my god, um, uh, oh my god, why did I forget his name? Um, uh, I'm not sure. I'm probably gonna butcher his name because I haven't looked up pronunciation. But Sesue ha- Hayakawa. Yeah, yeah. Um, who went on to be nominated for a, a Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor in Bridge Over the River Kwai, Bridge Indeed. on the River Kwai, um. So yeah, he was like a super. He was already pretty popular in silent films in Japan, and uh, he came over to the U.S. and started being in silent films here. But he's playing a he's playing a character that is incidentally Asian, right? Yeah. Um, like his Asianness is not the source of villainy in the mm-hmm. way that it is in Birth of a Nation. He 
I mean, and so I can understand the criticism at the time, but I think with a um, look, if, if this film were to come out now, I don't think it actually would be a problem because Asians can be bad guys too, you know? <laughs> I think, I think considering the time it was released in, I do think this movie sort of like has this icky element of kind of uh, a, a a foreigner being this like source of danger and yeah. of like, uh, like they're, they're going to, they're going to take your women sort of thing. Right. Um, right. Like there is there, I think there is a similar sort of like reactionary, fearful, uh, place uh, that yeah of the that, other yeah that this movie is is sort of um playing upon I guess um that is you know not not a great look um but it he is at least he is an actual character yeah and, you know it and it, it does it I don't think. They do a lot to to kind of otherize him, um, I think, but it does. His villainy is is definitely played as like, oh yeah, he's he's like a fucked up dude. Um, yeah, he's got he's got interiority. He's like a real person. Uh, he's yeah, just he's just he, bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, the basic story of this, which I I honest I gotta say I like this movie a lot. I thought yeah. it was really fun to watch. I thought that the the story and the vibe and the cinematography all felt very Hollywood of the 1940s, you know, mm. which I guess it's, it's very noirish. Yeah. Before but, that ever existed. Yeah. Um and it's also like got like a sort of, you know, high society drama in a breakfast at Tiffany's sort of way, too. Um, mm. like socialites uh, and all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. This movie felt to me way out of its time, honestly. Um, yeah, uh, just yeah. in terms of vibe and um. But anyway, the story is um that there is a, a wealthy stockbroker and his wife, who um is you know she lives this the high social life yeah. and and she's like spending all his money or something <laughs> uh he gets a bill for like fifteen hundred dollars in 1915 money in dresses um yeah and uh and and he's kind of shocked and he's in the process of investing a bunch of his own money in a stock uh investment that he is very confident will pay off uh and so he's like, hey, my cash flow isn't so good right now. So can you like can it on the dresses for a little while? Um, and she's like, no. <laughs> if like, like you, you get me and the dresses or you don't get me. Like I got to live in high society. Um, they kind of brush it off. And I've go- grown accustomed to a certain lifestyle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> End quote. Um they go to like a kind of high society party and they interact with this guy, uh, either uh, Tori or Ar- Araku. Arakau? Arakau. Um, I mean, Arakau and- is what it says in all the intertitles, but that's because the only surviving version of the movie is the, the re release. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he he's kind of like he's kind of sexy and she's sort of like she's sort of like oh who's this guy you know um this movie was supposedly like sort of a um a a catapulting of sesue hayakawa into like a a sort of bad boy sex symbol in uh 1920s or 1910s film i mean for like the earlier part of this movie before he turns into a creep yeah he's he's kind of hot yeah yeah. Um. And I one thing this movie I think does pretty well, especially in the early parts, that really separates it from something like The Birth of a Nation, is it actually <laughs> succeeds in creating like sexual tension. Mm-hmm. Like there's all these scenes of um I forgot what the character's name is, but Fanny Ward is is the actor playing the the wife, um of her and and uh Hayakawa interacting. And at first, it does seem like oh, like they they know each other through like high society, um, and, like they and they like in, 
they get along like, like like spending time together and like as the sort of early part of the movie goes on the, there's more there's more and more tension between them too and like oh they're like going on car rides together and stuff um <laughs> and then you know it, it takes a, a very dark turn um but i i don't know i i had i can't remember seeing a movie sort of like building up that sort of relationship before this where it's like ooh something's going on there yeah yeah um so at this party um uh, so she she in in a sort of earlier establishing thing she's kind of like as one of her high society operations she is the treasurer of the local red cross group of rich ladies who donate to red cross and um there's a guy at this party that they're all at um that says hey your husband his stock thing it's no good it's not it doesn't make any sense i think that this stock option is going to blow up and if you give me if you give me some money i'll double it for you by tomorrow and now anytime any anyone ever says give me your money i'll double it by tomorrow that person is <laughs> you will never so, see that money again and indeed she doesn't um, <laughs> but she's like like hey i want to buy more dresses and i need that I, I want that doubled money so what do i do this guy seems pretty trustworthy so i'm going to do a little do a little embezzling um and take <laughs> the take the the money that so uh, the red cross society has um, gathered ten thousand dollars to give to Belgian refugees from ripped from the headlines from World War One, um, and uh, that is the equivalent of two hundred and sixty-two thousand dollars in today's dollars. Um, and she goes, eh, "I'll just you know take this out of that safe and give it to the guy, and then come back with five hundred thousand dollars." <laughs> um, but. The next day he comes back, it is it doesn't it didn't work out. She lost all of her money. Um and she's very distraught. Uh she she sees visions of uh the newspaper articles. Yeah. Uh, that say society woman steals Red Cross funds, speculates and loses ten thousand dollars. Uh yeah, and then and then that's when Arakau gets involved. <laughs> Yeah, he uh he sees this as his, his a moment that he can take advantage of. And so he he is sort of like, "Hey, I'll give you that $10,000 that you need that you stole from the Red Cross, but I'm going to need a little something in return." And he never explicitly says what he wants in return, but it's it's very implied of just sort of like you you, you know, he gives her the eyes. Um <laughs> And so she's like, well, I guess I have no choice. And so she, uh, what does she do? <laughs> um, well, she, she agrees. Uh, she, um, uh, and he actually like starts like whispering into her ear, all of the horrible things that could happen if the world finds out that she stole all of this money. Um, and, uh, so she she agrees because she has to. She goes back home, and when she does, she finds out that her husband's stock like really paid off, and they're just <laughs> mega rich now. Yeah. Um, uh, and she's like, "Oh my god! Oh my god! I can undo this! I can fix this!" Uh, she says, "Hey, hey, hey, buddy! I uh didn't want to tell you, but I lost ten thousand dollars playing bridge. Can I have ten thousand dollars? No questions asked." And he's like. Sure. <laughs> sure, babe. I got tons. We're loaded now. <laughs> I got tons of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Um, also, boy, oh boy. Even now, if you lost 10 grand playing bridge, yikes. In 1915 yeah. money, that's like, that's insanity. I feel like. Yeah. But, um, you know, high society and all that. Well, yeah, that's, that's $260,000. <laughs> <laughs> so she runs back to uh, a rock house place uh and says like hey like here's the ten thousand dollars can we just undo this like i i've got the money i'll just give it back to you and he says uh no take backsies yeah um and at that point she gets like really scared um and she well, yeah he, he tells one of his 
like men servants to lock the door at that point like yeah you're like he basically kidnaps her at that point yeah. um and this is where the movie gets real, way more way darker and more intense than i expected it yeah to go um she threat i mean she threatens suicide to be like don't don't touch me or i'll kill myself yeah um and he hands her a knife. He's just like, do it. Yeah, You're not gonna he's do like, it. he's like, do it, do it. Um, and she doesn't. Um, and then he brands her with his, uh, his, his little, his, his symbol, which he he shows her earlier when they're at his house. Yeah, in a like, very phallic way. He's like, hey, yeah. look at my look at my brand here. You know, that yeah. I used to um to put my stamp on all of my ivory that I sell. Um, um, and he's, and he's like, uh, Oh, I put this on, on, on things to show that I own them. Um, and he like grabs her and, and like pulls her hair back from the back of her neck and brands her with his, with his, uh, his symbol of ownership. Yeah. It's really dark. Um, it is. And it's like, it's, it's rare to see, I think, uh, like violence depicted in this, like, it in with this level of realism, yeah. For something this early, I think yeah. most of the violence tends to be, you know, someone gets shot and like really over dramatically reacts to it, mm-hmm. or or something like that. Um, whereas this is like, oh yikes, this is yeah, it's grody. very intense. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, by the way, I was just. Like I wonder that um that whole offering her the knife thing is a little rather dark. This this actor Sesue Hayakawa, bef- um he like due to oh my god I forget exactly why but there was like due to some kind of success based shame when he was eighteen back in Japan he tried to commit ritual suicide uh, with with a knife uh, and his dad stopped him. It was it was his dad being disappointed in him that prompted him to do it holy shit yeah i didn't know that um and so gotta be kind of heavy for him to just go like hey here have a knife i bet you can't do it you know yeah yeah um so at this point in the movie she uh she gets hold of a gun um and uh does he offer a, a, a knife or a gun uh earlier he he holds up and like when she, yeah he he holds up a knife and says like if you want to kill yourself here's a knife you know but he mm. does have a gun on him that she's able to grab and then shoot him yeah. to get away um she shoots him kind of in the shoulder um it's a, a non fatal gunshot wound but then she, so then she escapes and we cut to outside where the the husband has shown up being he's kind of suspicious that something's going on between uh his wife and uh Arakau. Arako. Um, and there's a great shot where he sees through the the sort of um, uh, the paper door, Japanese style paper door. Yeah. Inside the silhouette of uh, Arako, uh sort of sliding down the side of the door in silhouette yeah. and it leaves a, 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 a blood stain. Um very cool very stylish very cool yeah it's like it's it's just a, a great shot um and then he he like smash he smashes through the door <laughs> um and uh and you know pick, picks up the gun and then uh the the authorities arrive and they're like this guy's been shot you know who did it yeah um and the husband kind of puts puts two and two together, kind of realizes what has happened and takes takes the fall. He's like, I I shot him. And so then now the, the film becomes a, a, a courtroom drama about yeah. the, the murder tri- or the the attempted murder trial. And this this, by the way, feels like a very modern depiction of like a crime and courtroom sort of situation. I feel like the last time we saw like a crime and then courtroom was in the Dreyfus uh, affair the Dreyfus affair yeah yeah and that was you know stylistically leagues behind this yeah 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 um and uh yeah there's there's a 
during the trial, there's another really, really great shot um, of the uh, the husband in his his dark jail cell with the the light mm-hmm. kind of projecting the the bars, similar to another shot from a uh, phantom of like light coming through and like projecting the yeah, shape of the bars four. on the window. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah. Very stark, like reminiscent of uh, kind of like film noir aesthetic. Um, and uh, this is this whole courtroom thing. And he's like, they're like, why'd you shoot him? And he's like, I don't remember. I just, I, trust me. I shot him. Um, it's like I don't want to say anymore. I just shot him. Just <laughs> yeah. Um, but so, uh, I believe the the wife talks to him in in jail. And what do you remember? What the the next the next beat is? She she visits him in jail, and uh, you know she, they kind of fill each other in on the situation, and she's she's horrified, and when when. When she tells him what happened, um, he kind of, like, forgives her. He realizes that she was put in this terrible position. And, um, and they're, 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 you know, kissing passionately. And then a guard walks up and he, like, looks into the cage. And no touching. Like, oh. <laughs> Reference. Um. A lot of those this episode. Yeah, they can't. Um, they can't try a man. They can't try a husband and wife for the same crime. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, um, and then uh, it kind of fast forwards to the courtroom itself. Uh, at first, the prosecution uh, goes and they are questioning Hayakawa uh, or the uh, 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 Arakawa about. Um, what was happening in the situation. And he was basically, you know, he seemed to be just fine with this plan of, uh, send, send the husband to jail. He didn't seem too fond of him. Yeah. I think, I think, uh, she even goes to him to kind of like plead like, Oh, let's, you know, like let's, let's put this behind us. Like, let's figure out a situation where like my husband doesn't get thrown into jail. And he's like, it's out of my hands now. Like, if he gets tried for murder or attempted murder, like that's that's what happens. Yeah. Uh, so he plays along and he names the husband as the guy who shot him, uh, and then it's the defense's turn, and um, and he says nothing, and so the jury comes back and uh, they find him guilty, and the wife is is in such a like her, the, there's this kind of like really mounting pressure as mm-hmm. this like this false uh uh verdict is is you know is about to happen and you can see the, the like her getting super stressed out and when they say guilty she just jumps up and starts like and runs up to the judge and she like her husband tries to stop her but uh she she says like no it was me i did it i did it like i shot him and here's the proof and she Take, she pulls down the back of her dress and you can see the brand uh that that Arakau put on her and um and and she explains the whole situation and they're like okay like i guess we're throwing this case out <laughs> <laughs> um, uh and all of the people uh viewing the um, like the, the whole when this happens, the whole courtroom erupts in chaos. People jump over the gate and and it seemed to try and attack Arakau. Um and mm-hmm. the judge is like holding him behind him, keeping him safe. Um, but then yeah, eventually at, at the end uh, they uh, they drop the case and they walk away and they l- get to live together happily ever after. rich yeah. and rich and uh, and and rescued from our cow's grasp <laughs> indeed um yeah i mean i think there is definitely some 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 icky racial politics going on in this movie mm-hmm. um that i do not care for um but i think despite that i think uh i just think um says we high cow's uh performance comes across really 
well. Like he's he's really he's really good in this, even if he's playing a sort of reductive character at times. Um, he 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 brings it. You know, he does a lot of a lot of smoldering, which he's yeah. very good at. <laughs> um, but it's you know he he has a uh uh there's a lot of sort of good subtle acting from him. I think. Yeah, uh, I think everybody does great acting. Yeah, uh, him and the wife are both amazing. This I think had the best dramatic acting of anything I watched from this year. Yeah. Um. Uh, I I did sort of when I was first watching it, I was like, hey, maybe maybe they just cast a Japanese actor because he's so good at smoldering. Um, but there is there is an intertitle towards the end, which is I don't have the exact wording of it but it's something of like east and west shan't meet or some variation of that sort of oh idea. man i didn't i didn't think of that um yeah. and it you know it it, it really kind of drives home this this idea of that like uh you know interracial mixing is like the worst evil which is like c- come on come on guys <laughs> come on 1915 um and so that that definitely i was like oh, okay this is actually what their intent was apparently and so <laughs> I'd, I'd even lost a lot of respect for the movie as like uh, i didn't actually notice that really. it's like artistic so, intent oops. you know yeah um i mean apart from that but considering that i didn't notice that i thought this movie was just captivating i i, yeah. I thought that the drama was really good the storytelling was done super well mm-hmm. i think that a lot of other movies would have been a lot more clunky with this with the story yeah yeah um uh yeah i and cool vibe good drama uh yeah. <laughs> I, I think um it's almost like the cecil b demille guy is is going places Th- this kid. i wonder if anything will be named after him yeah <laughs> um this movie got remade twice uh i think one time in 1922 something like that another silent mm. film that is lost and then it was made and that used the japanese actor again and then it was remade again in 1931 as a talkie and they made him white um, so it's hmm. a story that doesn't really, you know, matter race wise. Yeah. No, um, it, it doesn't. Uh, so there's that at least, hmm. uh, a lot of be, racism this episode. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's the episode for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, what was your favorite film from this year? Yeah, I mean, you know, I you you really put a different tone on the cheat for me uh, <laughs> with with telling me that the whole thing was intentionally racist. Uh, but I'm going to ignore that. <laughs> and, uh, I I really like the cheat. I thought it was mm. super fun. Uh, um, I, I respect hypocrites a lot, though. <laughs> mm. Yeah, hypocrites was was super good. Uh, that was my favorite feature that we watched. Uh, my favorite overall was the tramp. Yeah. Um. So if if we're if we're including shorts in our favorite lists, yes. Uh, then it's the tramp all the way. The tramp um, is super solid. Yeah. Um. So, uh, this is a a big episode for for a for a big movie that we had to talk about. Yeah. Um. A ne- birth got- of the nation length. Podcast Ugh, yeah. episode. <laughs> uh, we unfortunately, I guess, have another uh, D.W. Cooper of this other famous epic, the year after Intolerance is is next week. Yeah. Um, which I am I'm somewhat excited to watch just to like see what it is because it is one of those movies that just gets talked about a lot and I've never seen. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's even longer. I think it's like three and a half. I think. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what what Chaplin keeps doing. I'm excited to see what Lois Weber keeps doing. Um, I'm excited this episode is is done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now I only got to edit it. Uh, but that's about it for this one. Thank you for listening to three hours yeah. of podcast. Please, please like and subscribe. Uh, you can follow us on the Instagram 
on the on the Twitter. Yeah, one week, one year, and the links are in the description. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Thanks to Marcus for coming and 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 being on the podcast. Uh, you can follow him at Marcus Scott Williams on on uh, Instagram once again. Um, and yeah, I guess that's about it. Yeah. Is that it, Glenn? That's it. Okay, well, I'll see you next year. See you next year. From 21 Jump Street. Not the cheat. Not the cheat. The cheat. The cheat. How do you do? Um, I don't know, the cheat. I don't think it was very good at all.